Guarding Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, quite a big agenda, so we'll move straight in. Um, item one, then the apologies. Uh, we have apologies this morning, Chair, from uh, Mr. McMahon, Mrs. Perry, and Mrs. Uh, Burnett Faulkner. Um, can I also say we, we've got a new member, which is Mrs. Thompson, um, and she was only put on at the end of last week, so she's unable to come this morning as well. Thank you. Um, item two, declarations of interest. Uh, item three, minutes of the meeting held on the 4th of January. I assume everyone's seen them and had an opportunity to read them. And Are you happy that I signed them as a true and accurate record? Thank you. Item four, uh, MASH review and adoption of a uh, Staffordshire children's front door. Uh, Councillor Sutton. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, so, um, for those of you uh, who, who know, ab know about these things, the um, multi-agency safeguarding hub or hubs across the country was something that was introduced uh, as generally good practice around 2011. Uh, and since then, uh, ours has developed uh, and others have de developed, and we set ours up then uh, combination with children's services, adult services, both for Staffordshire and for and for Stoke. Um, and over the over the over the years, these have started to develop. And I think what's interesting is that 80% of uh, local authorities that have an outstanding for Ofsted do not have a mash. They do their multi-agency safeguarding arrangements in a slightly, in a different way. Uh, and, th and this paper is about our journey and how we uh, have, for children's services in particular, uh, a front door uh, that involves a multi-agency approach uh, and how we develop that going forward. And this has not just been brought about, but is the catalyst, I think, for this was the fact uh, Stoke-on-Trent had an inadequate Ofsted a few years ago and as part of their decision making process they decided they want to go it alone. So they have pulled out uh, as of last year out of the MASH arrangements which has left us in a position where we've got to decide exactly how we do things together with ourselves and the police and health which are the three statutory partners around safeguarding arrangements for children but also with any other partners education uh, and the like that, that have got something to add to the value of that. So today I've got uh, Nisha, uh, Nisha with me and Clive, who is Clive, he's going to go through the presentation. He's going to explain a little bit about the, um, the way the MASH has developed over, over time, what we need, what we needed, what it needed to do and our thoughts about how we go forward with it. And obviously we would very much welcome members thoughts on that journey so that we can uh, actually finalize where we're going to go with 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 this so um i'll hand over to clive if that's okay thank you members have had sight of that uh and uh and i hope people can actually see the presentation because i'm realizing now that the uh, the print is rather small, to be honest. Uh, I'm long-sighted, so um, uh, all good. Uh, uh, so, as, as, as Mark had said, uh, Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent ma MASH was developed around 2011. Uh, and for, for people that, that are aware of sort of MASH arrangements, uh, the safeguarding hubs co-locate a range of agencies. So the statutory agencies are the police, children's social care, adult social care, uh, health, uh, and also colleagues from, uh, from probation. And the idea of a MASH is co-locating those agencies uh, to share those statutory functions, to share information, uh, and it's about um, meeting those statutory obligations, but also about identifying emerging risks. Because every uh, serious case review will say, uh, what, you know, uh, what was the communication like and how was information shared? Uh, one of the things that I 
will be talking a little bit about, and people might have questions about, is the co-location element of it. Because I don't think you can uh, underplay at all the benefits of agencies being together in the same place and appropriately uh, sharing information. So as Mark said, part of the uh, catalyst for some of these changes has been um, uh, the actions of our colleagues in Stoke and Trent who've actually, uh, well, they physically left the MASH in 2021, but then have formally uh, left the MASH and put their own governance arrangements in place for their own arrangements uh, in uh, uh, March of 2023. So to a certain extent, what you have uh, in the current location of the MASH is one partner has left, Staffordshire uh, Children's Services and Adult Services are still in the MASH, uh, alongside police partners, health partners, and other partners contribute, contributing to all sorts of safeguarding activity. So it was just to be kind of clear about that, really. We're not starting from a, a clear uh, a blank piece of paper. Uh, this is actually arrangements that are quite well established, that have been developed over a long period of time, and those relationships and understandings are really good. Okay. So, people will be aware of the actual children's front door, which is our contribution to the, to the MASH arrangements. Uh, and um, that has been through some uh, significant changes in the last few years. So members might be aware that during the children's transformation in 2021, uh, at that time the children's front door was actually called first response, and that might be something that people are quite familiar with. Uh, that arrangement had predominantly unqualified staff uh, uh, taking calls and taking inquiries from uh, agencies and the general public. And they were supervised by a small group of uh, social workers. In the transformation, we changed this round quite dramatically uh, in that now we have predominantly qualified, experienced social work staff. We've still retained a small group of unqualified workers and the single team manager was replaced by two team managers. That was part of a, uh, a specific model of working uh, developed by somebody called Professor Thorpe, uh, and many local authorities have used those um, uh, ways of, uh, uh, of um, uh, w uh, operating their front doors. And actually part of the idea of that is about having very experienced social work staff at the front of the process to have restorative uh, conversations with members of the general public and with agencies so that you have that sort of rich uh, and um, uh, thorough examination of issues. That has worked really well, I've got to say, and the feedback from agencies and partners has, has been really good. Um, at the same time, and members might remember this, uh, th there was a single phone number for first response and all the phone calls actually just came straight into us. That involved a lot of wasted calls as well, people ringing us all about all sorts of different things. Uh, so as part of the, um, that development, that was replaced by an IVR system alongside um, uh, partners from uh, uh, customer services. Uh, uh, and actually the, w the, um, developed a single, fr uh, single phone number uh, for all uh, for all children's services inquiries, so that covers you know the uh, front door single point of access for send and all sorts of other services, and that has, has considerably cut down the number of wasted calls that we have. So now when people are phoning us, they are uh, getting through quickly. Uh, they're speaking to qualified staff, and actually the feedback that we have is that's that's uh, that's working well for people. Okay. So, in terms of partners in Stoke-on-Trent leaving and, and what, what that kind of leaves us with, uh, we spent some time thinking about, about the location, because obviously there are several options, aren't there, about what we might want to do. So, actually, there was quite a strong commitment to remaining in the current location along with, uh, alongside other partners. And I think there's some real benefit in that. And actually, in the last few weeks, uh, some other uh, uh, bits of the police force have actually joined us. Uh, so actually we now have the 
uh, ex child exploitation police are based on the same floor in in the mash. Uh, we've got the missing police who are based in, on, on that first floor in the mash. We've got the disclosure and barring service. Uh, we've also got uh, easy access to the uh, management of sex offenders and violent offenders uh, in Staffordshire. So we've got a really good opportunity there to be doing some really good uh, partnership working with quite a diverse range of um, uh, 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 partners. Uh, we've also co-located with partners from health uh, and um, uh, looking at uh, co-locating with um, uh, a strong contingent from uh, probation. We've got lots of other people that we obviously um, you know, contact virtually as well. So it's going to be that continued co-location uh, with, with partners there and those functions. Um, the method of uh, information sharing at the moment, and actually I've mentioned this a couple of times, and I don't want to, uh, I suppose, speak too much about systems and whatnot, but the, our method of communication is via an ISL log, information sharing log, that is actually owned by Staffordshire County Council. It sits on a Staffordshire County Council server. Uh, so again, Stoke-on-Trent are still using that. Uh, so although they've actually left the MASH, they are still using that system until they can develop their own. But once they do develop that and, and leave that, then obviously we'll, we will still be left with the uh, information sharing log. We have looked at some alternatives and updating that. It seems to be working well at the moment. Um, uh, th there are some alternatives that could have been used within Care Director, but as you know, that's not necessarily going to be a possibility moving forward. Uh, so that's working well, working fine, and uh, it won't make any difference once partners actually leave the, uh, the arrangement. Uh, we have some updated SLAs in, in place with, with those partners, and specifically the latest one was with our partners in health. Uh, there are information sharing agreements in place, uh, and again, once, the, uh, once Stoke on Trent colleagues finally leave the information sharing uh, uh, arrangements, those, uh, those are ready to be updated. They won't change fundamentally, but... Uh, Uh, so I think I've mentioned some of these things already around the information sharing. Uh, MASH partnership arrangements at the moment very much focus on those statutory functions. Uh, there are aspirations to be looking at uh, how we engage with family hubs and that more sort of local, uh, local offer, tier two. Uh, so anything that's not uh, reaching a statutory threshold um, Obviously, there are uh, discussions going on. I'll talk about it a little bit later about how we may address that on a on a local on a local footprint. Uh, we have changed some of the arrangements in terms of customer services as we moved on, and uh, we've developed now uh, uh, customer services taking uh, all of our phone calls and uh, all of the uh, written referrals, and then they come through to uh, there's a safeguarding gateway within. Uh, the SCAS team and an early help gateway. I won't go into too much detail about that at the moment. Uh, that's uh, that's an inf information uh, system uh, which is was, was specifically designed for around BRFC, Building Resilient Families. So it identified those families by bringing together information from the DWP, the police, social care. Uh, so it identifies, uh, you know, families who are having a high level of service input, uh, but it can be useful in other, in, in other settings. And what we were looking at was uh, people in localities, so family hubs, police in harm reduction hubs, could use that information as a sort of an indicator, not a definitive uh, measure, but an indicator of uh, what might be going on within that sort of household. Okay. And we are trying some of those approaches out in uh, localities. So, in terms of governance, there's an operational board now, which is Stafford, specifically Staffordshire Children's Services. Uh, that meets bi-monthly. Uh, there is a MASH project board, which is overseeing uh, the changes in Stoke Leaving and uh, what, what other partners are doing. That includes our colleagues in uh, adult services. Um, 
we were having a mo uh, monthly future vision planning partnership meeting, uh, which we did actually hold at the MASH. Uh, some of those arrangements are now um, in place. Uh, so we're moving much more to uh, trying to scope out what the early help offer is, uh, how people might access things like family hubs, tier two services, family support. Uh, and that's being led as part of the um, uh, ways of working uh, stream. We're regularly reporting to the SSCB. We uh, 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 presented our, some of the changes that we're making back in June 2023 and uh, uh, fed also fed back to the SSCB, I think only a few weeks ago. Uh, so there is that regular uh, reporting function. Talked about the ISL replacement, interoperability with uh, Staffordshire uh, systems. So we are in some discussions with, with our police colleagues about how they might be able to uh, access reports from our social care systems so that if they're trying to triage low level situations, uh, they could have access to uh, basic information from our systems. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, FIDO, within parameters, obviously some of the information in, in there is from the police anyway. Um, uh, so that, that will assist those sort of local arrangements. Um, we continue to develop customer services and you, you may be aware in other uh, respects that the telephone systems are being updated. Uh, our systems are being updated at the same time, so we'll have the benefits of net call implementation, which means we may be able to uh, have access to uh, services like being able to text um, uh, people who are actually contacting us and various other things, and it has got that uh, uh, customer uh, resources management system in place. Uh, perform uh, managing performance has been difficult because the ISL provided quite a lot of information, but it was quite hard to disaggregate that. Uh, I'm pleased to say though that those functions have been disaggregated and we are able to actually uh, report on what difference the MASH is making, i.e., uh, you know, we can actually scope out how many information shares are going on, what the outcomes of those are, who's doing it, what the time frames are. So we should be able to actually uh, come up with some um, quite detailed information about what difference that's making. Uh, that's in addition to the uh, performance uh, information that we uh, also uh, all, uh, provide already uh, in terms of the uh, children's front door. Okay, uh, we're also engaging in multi-agency audits. So um, again, since we've uh, split from uh, Stoke on Trent, we've already had two of those audits undertaken. We've got another 10 audits planned for next year. Uh, so that's facilitated by colleagues in our performance team, uh, but that's a, a multi-agency audit. So we're looking at, looking at things together as different agencies and trying to flag up you know, where, uh, where there are improvements. Sorry, that was quite a quick race through, and I, I understand there was a lot of information there. Uh, so uh, you may have some questions. Uh, Clive, thank you uh, for that. That was very useful. Um, Councillor Eagland, I think you uh, indicated. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it's been a, a few years since I visited MASH itself, and um, we're encouraging the chairman uh, to try and make arrangements for us to visit there again. Um, I, I'd, I've got a couple of questions that I, I'd like your answers on. Uh, the information of sharing log, you said in great detail before that that you were no longer uh, part and parcel with, Sto with the uh, Stoke on Trent, um, and um, now you're telling us that they're still involved with the information sharing log. Um, the other one is, um, uh, social workers. Um, you explained that there was a, mount, a new um, an intake of social workers. Uh, I'm, I want to be reassured that you're not dragging them off from the front line of our um, children's departments, and I'd like your assurance on that, please. Um, and um, I've always understood that MASH was the backup system for everything. Um, you know, the first telephone call might go to the police, but the MASH is still that uh, 
area of a backup system. Whenever any complaint or any comes, comes in, it goes to MASH to the right departments because they're all under one roof. Is that right? Does that still happen? Uh, and also, please, Chairman, could we have bigger print next time? <laughs> for, the people looking, for the people looking in today, if I can't see it, then they can't see it either. So if you wouldn't mind, that would be gratefully appreciated. That's it. Thank you, Chair. Clive. Thank you. That's uh, okay. So I, I hope I've got the, the, the questions right. So in terms of the information sharing log, uh, the, there will be people using that at the moment that will, won't be using it in the future. So obviously, although Stoke have, have left, they've got their own governance arrangements. Part of, and part of the, um, the uh, MASH project board is, is tracking the, um, uh, the progression of Stoke in developing their own systems. Because they have uh, something called Liquid Logic. Uh, that actually has a MASH component in it. So I believe that they were testing that before Christmas and that they are ready to go live with it, but they haven't formally got that process in place yet. Once they do, they will leave the uh, information sharing log. At the moment, they have got those... Uh, the, the inf well, it, the, the testing was, uh, like I say, was before Christmas. Uh, obviously, it's another local authority, and it's another local authority developing their system. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we we understood it would have been six months from the day that they left, which was end of March. Obviously, it's been significantly longer than that. But um, so hopefully, you're giving them a nudge, are you? Absolutely. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Well, in in some ways, it, it's. Um, it's not, it's not ideal for us as well because obviously uh, we want to be able to get that performance information out of the system and keep it clean, you know, so it's actually just staff, Staffordshire. But, uh, yeah, so that, that's the reason that, 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 uh, that that's, still, that's still in place. Uh, so uh, once, once they leave, uh, and there are things we can do then to actually close off that system so that uh, information isn't visible. Uh, so uh, it would just become a Staffordshire system. Uh, in terms of social workers, so th this happened during the children's transformation, which, um, I mean, members will be familiar wi with that and, and, and the process around that. Um, some social workers did choose to leave um, uh, 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 um, so those frontline teams to, to actually join, join the team. Um, what I can say is that was an initial... Thing. And actually, there were some people who maybe were in situations where they needed a change. You know, th there were one or two people who may have been off sick previously and wanted to do something that was substantially different from the, uh, from the day job. What I can say now is, and, and, and from 2021, is that uh, a number of people have gone back to that frontline practice. Uh, and the other thing that we are doing, because obviously uh, colleagues might have been critical at one time, we're not poaching people from frontline teams. We're attracting quite a lot of new people in who have actually worked for lo other local authorities. And have, 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 uh, some people are actually travelling a reasonable distance to work with us. So we've got people who are travelling from places like Birmingham, uh, Wolverhampton. It w so hopefully we're not diluting the... Um, uh, you know, the workforce. Uh, and I think the other thing you were asking me about, I didn't quite understand the question about, about MASH being a backup yeah. system. Um, so, um, obviously, the, the benefits of being co-located. So, um, you may be aware, if there, if there are specific police operations going on, if there's a major incident, uh, you know, we do get to hear about that, first of all. Um, I'm not quite sure about the idea of it being a backup system. Uh, I mean, we, we receive uh, referrals about new situations, new things, emerging risks uh, in a variety of ways, but uh, I wasn't quite sure what the... Uh, ...before the police or any social worker to go through to MASH to get information from them. Does that still happen? Yeah, I, th I think I understand what you say. I, I, um, yeah, so w w uh, information sharing goes on at all sorts of levels. 
w w within the mash. So there's the, the statutory arena where we're looking at situations where it's around a, uh, what we would term as like a section 47, very serious incidents involving, uh, involving children and young people. Um, there is uh, there's in, informal uh, uh, information sharing goes on as well in, in, in that space. Uh, and I, I think I understand your question correctly. So it, it's a sort of an environment where actually uh, we can deal, you know, quite dynamically with, uh, you know, uh, serious threats or unusual things happening. Um, uh, so, yeah, that response is available. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that I haven't necessarily understood your question. Yeah. So, Councillor, like Clive said, MASH is a very focused space. There are statutory responsibilities around MASH. Like Clive said, anything that is Section 47, serious risk of harm, is, is dealt with in MASH. But MASH is not a backup route to getting to police information, and it cannot be used in that way because it will then get swamped, and then you, know, you will not have the space left to make those urgent decisions. So we do have a, a, a challenge of non-urgent police checks, and there is a significant backlog with that, but we are dealing with our police colleagues. We know they are going through a, a, a whole series of transformation within police force, so it is with the most senior officers in police who are taking a lead of how we, they deal with our non-urgent police checks. But MASH, we need to maintain that sanctity to make sure the speed and accuracy of that information sharing and decision making. And whilst I am speaking, shall I take responsibility for the small print? And I must thank you, thank every councillor, because I am trying to, you know, this is the first time Clive is in front of scrutiny, and it is important for senior leaders to face scrutiny and other spaces like this to develop their skills and leadership. And I should have take, I will take responsibility. I should have checked that before it reached here. So I take full responsibility and thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're forgiven. Uh, Councillor Edgar. Thank you very much, Chairman, and good morning, everybody. And thank you, Mark and uh, Clive, for your presentation, and Nisha as well. My question really relates to, you said health has come on board now with MASH, and I'd like a little bit more input as to how that is working, and also um, regarding mental health. Do you have anybody there with mental health pra you know, practitioners or... Anybody that's coming in that you find is, you know, I'd just like a little bit more input into that, please. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, health have been partners in, in the MASH, really, from the inception. So that was, goes back to 2011. There's a specific team that provide information to us and a part of uh, strategy discussions and providing information. Uh, and they're overseen by MPFT. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, but they do gather in information from other organisations uh, within the health family. So we do have representation in terms of uh, in uh, in terms of mental health. Uh, Claire Histed is the uh, is the current lead for that. Uh, so, and we do have people who uh, are available to attend sp uh, if we have specific information sharing requests, who are able to respond to that as well. Uh, so there's, a, there's an actual team in the, in the MASH, so MPFT have access to all that information. Uh, also, we, we have actually access to health information ourselves now, because obviously you'll be aware of the development of the um, uh, uh, social care, uh, um, health care information, which is linked to uh, you know, our, um, our social care uh, uh, record as well. Uh, but uh, yes, that, that, that's been available for the duration. Uh, I suppose what I was kind of um, alluding to was the co-location in that health are actually going to be coming to join us on that first floor of, um, of the MASH. Uh, so we'll be literally co-located with us. So there's that opportunity for not only formal information sharing, but there's that informal uh, an, an advice and guidance type of uh, role as well available. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I better <coughs> declare an interest. I'm the partner governor of Midland Partnership Foundation Trust from the county. Thank you. Belatedly recorded. 
Uh, Councillor Snow. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I don't know who this is addressed to, so I'll, I'll tell you the story first. Yesterday I was talking to a grandmother uh, who I dealt with first 33 years ago when I ran the vice squad. Uh, she was what we would call trafficked today. In those days, she was a, a juvenile street prostitute before the law was perhaps, or before implementation was changed about 95, 96, where they were treated as victims. But in those days, once they got two street cautions, they were charged, whether they were juvenile, whatever, and they went to court. <coughs> She's now working with the Home Office and other ladies all in the country because. Uh, she can't work with, uh, she can't become a guide leader. She can't become anything because she's got sexual offences against her. She tried to go to America and she was refused permission because she's got this. Uh, she's now working with the Home Office to try and get some of these convictions expunged for her and other girls, or ladies from another country. It's not really about her I'm talking about, it's ladies in the future. Are we the mash looking at any type of uh, modern slavery that where, where girls are being tra traded up and down the country? We know it's, I mean, it's been, it, it is a national picture, I'm not being funny. We look at what happened in Telford, we go Rochdale, we go Thames Valley, we go the Metropolitan. Uh, we know it's national. Are we looking at anything in Staffordshire to help ladies, young girls, who are going through those sort of things? Because it's not just going to affect them now. As I say, uh, I spoke to her yesterday, I spoke to her first 32, 33 years ago. So her life was changed forever because of what happened to her when she was a juvenile uh, working in the streets. So I think what, what you're quite right, aren't you? Because I think uh, a lot of the, uh, the difficulty back in the day, again, was the sort of language that was put around some of these situations, which actually uh, criminalised the, uh, the young person who was actually a victim of exploitation. So it's child sexual exploitation. And I think, as you said, obviously, uh, people have become more aware of that. Uh, there's been some major scandals, and th that, that continues, doesn't it? You know, it's uh, never far from the press, is it, really? Uh, so, um, as I said earlier, some of the opportunities that we have got, certainly from uh, my perspective, from a MASH perspective, so there is a child sexual exploitation team, uh, certainly in, in, in so, uh, children's social care. There is in the Staffordshire Police Force as well. Uh, they're now co-located. In fact, they sit right outside my office at, at, at the MASH. So certainly are we aware of those uh, issues? Absolutely. Uh, and when those young people are identified as... as uh, like I said, the, the language has changed entirely, hasn't it, really? And, and, and a good thing, too. So uh, we, we don't refer to any young people now as being in, you know, in prostitution. They are being sexually abused and... Uh, that is child sexual, sexual exploitation. So I think people are much more clear about that. So I'm hoping, and it, this is, it's quite a, a, a new development actually having those teams uh, with us in the building. Uh, so for, certainly from a MASH perspective, which I guess is what I'm here to talk about, uh, uh, we, we're identifying those issues right at the front door, right when that information comes in. Uh, I guess the other thing to, to mention is that obviously we are actively involved in some of the uh, police operations which are around those particular issues and again the, um, uh, the availability of information sharing within the MASH environment helps support all that sort of activity. Uh, you mentioned modern slavery as well which also is another police team which is also moving into the next building uh, by the end of March and they're going to be co-located with our adult colleagues on the ground floor of the building. So I know we've got, um, uh, Helen has very kindly arranged for uh, members to come up and have a look at the MASH, I think on the 28th of February. So I think we hopefully we can uh, give people a real feel for what uh, you know the sort of work that's going on the sort of approaches that we've got and the fact that it's a partnership approach as well what i'm really saying is that what's happening to these juveniles is modern slavery now it's not just with adults they are being traded up and down the country so in a way they're slaves really so it's i'm trying to put the two together to say that uh, they're not separate issues that's exactly right. And uh, if I can just assure you, we have a whole, and, and I think more, all local authorities have got a very clear process 
on how to support, identify, support, and work together with other partners when these kind of situations are identified. But in Staffordshire, I have found no reason for concern that we are not following due diligence and supporting these young people quite diligently. In fact, uh, wherever there is any, any issues identified, especially in police operations, we have got, uh, you know, we work together and this post-transformation, the district model does allow greater communication and visibility of various professionals involved at different stages in that child or young person's life. So absolutely, we are on it. There's a clear process which is being followed and there is no, no challenges that we have seen uh, in terms of achieving good outcomes for those children. It, they are tough, they are very tough, but um, there are many various facets involved but uh, we are working through it. Small numbers, we are working through it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wong. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you for the presentation as well. I had my glasses on so I could see it. <laughs> it was very lucky that I brought them. Um, I, I just wanted to focus on the overall strategy with the BASH. Um, it says in the report that 80% of outstanding authorities do not have a formal MASH, um, and that the MASH is not an only model, the only model for effective mo uh, multi-agency cooperation information sharing. At uh, the last committee meeting, we heard from um, the independent uh, chair of the Safeguarding, Safeguarding Board, Children's Safeguarding Board, that we had some issues with information sharing across um, the various partners. Um, what other options have you considered other than the MASH that is currently in place. Um, have you done an options appraisal? And it would be nice if the committee could understand what those options are. And then secondly, in terms of the barriers to information sharing, do you have any examples that the committee um, can hear about so that they understand what those barriers are? Is it in relation to GDPR and data protection? Um, and, and is there anything that we can do more to resolve those sorts of situations? Thank you. So in terms of um, uh, an appraisal, uh, th that, that did take place at quite, uh, quite an early, early stage. Um, I suppose what I would reflect on, and, and there was quite a lot of research uh, carried out um, in the early I think it was about 2015, 2016, uh, in terms of arrangements for, for information sharing. Obviously, what I'm reflecting there is that um, certainly things like working together, the new version of working, doesn't talk about MASHES at all. It talks about uh, uh, information sharing, and it talks about multi-agency uh, safeguarding arrangements. So I guess there are different ways, that there are different ways of doing it. But I guess what we've reflected on is that there is no replacement for that co-location. Uh, and the co-location uh, is, is one of the critical uh, factors, I would say. So whilst there are some agencies that are uh, carrying on their business in a, in a sort of virtual way, I don't think there's any, uh, uh, there's any uh, replacement for actually building up those relationships uh, to actually being together and to actually being able to sort of share, share information in that way. Uh, so while some uh, authorities are moving away from those, those MASH arrangements, and part of it, I think, is about um, perhaps retreating into an area where they're just focusing on a statutory function and not uh, issues which are uh, uh, less than uh, uh, less than that sort of statutory uh, function. It's about partnership working, people working together, assisting some of those, uh, assisting some of those ways of thinking and ways of, ways of working together. Uh, so uh, certainly we, we did, um, you know, dwell on the idea of, you know, do we actually move back to, you know, an, another location and, uh, you know, effectively be on our own? Uh, or do we stay where we are with all the benefits of, uh, uh, having partners on hand for those informal and formal discussions, building up those relationships, and actually putting those you know sort of strong, strong foundations in place for for information sharing. Um, I did actually view the 
uh, the committee meeting it, in which colleagues from the safeguarding board, I think it was uh, Mr. Vinyl, shared shared those views. And obviously, um, ev every uh, serious case review and, and rapid review will re will refer to information sharing and the quality of that. Um, I guess I can speak from a point of view of the location that I'm in and, and, and the sort of arrangements that we have in place. And certainly there aren't any barriers to information sharing uh, in, in the location that I'm at. But I recognise that in other areas that, that may be a feature. And I guess, you know, we can use some of the, uh, the models of working and ways of working that, that, that we have in the MASH to actually model uh, you know how you, how you, we share information in a responsible and appropriate way. Uh, I think all too often GDPR is used as a as an excuse for not sharing information, but certainly working together is very clear about that. Is that it should never be used as a reason not to do that if the welfare of a child or vulnerable person is at risk. Back on the, on the information sharing piece, I think the difficulty perhaps that practitioners face is that what what's the threshold for a person being vulnerable? Because that, I think, is a terminology within GDPR, the Data Protection Act. Um, obviously, if that person is vulnerable, then presumably agencies can share information because you are protecting that person um, from harm. If, if you're outside of that threshold, then that's where the problems come. It, how are we dealing with that latter piece? Uh, because it might be that someone who is perhaps not in our... Um, higher tiers, shall we say, children in care or, or whatever. Um, we, we, we look at there, there are some harms taking place, don't quite meet the threshold, then we can't share information. Is that, is that still a problem? Thank you. So if, if I can just take back to the, uh, to the response I gave earlier, that is still a problem. So what Ian was talking about is, is a challenge, but it's, it's a challenge that is recognized by the partnership and um, in particular, uh, I would say, so when we're talking about CSPRs and information sharing, like Clive said, is always an issue. There are many facets to it. There are no issues of information sharing at the front door because of the statutory mash that is in place and the relationships that we have. Once cases move forward from there, even if they are a children in care, there might not be a safeguarding risk. Then that doesn't meet the threshold of information sharing because there is no safeguarding risk to a child in care because they are in care. And then becomes, therein comes the problem that non-urgent police checks because there is a huge backlog, there is a challenge. Within health, because health has got so many facets, there is a GP, there is a mental health practitioner for, for parents, for adults, there is one for child, and none of them share information amongst each other because health systems don't talk to each other. So almost always will we see in a, C in a CSPR, serious case review, that within health, there was information contained in files somewhere with a GP of a grandparent who, co who lives with the family, which wasn't shared that there was a risk because we were all focused on the child. So even though on the ground level, it feels like the health visitor has given the information about the child, the health visitor doesn't have the records of what GP is looking at, what everyone else is looking at, and therefore it's not well triangulated. That's a challenge, that's a national challenge, and everybody's aware of that. But there is a local challenge in Staffordshire, like I said, about the police checks. And we, are, we have been assured by colleagues in, in the police force that they are working through that, but we have to accept that there is a, a resource challenge or a, their, their own transformation challenge that they're going through. Um, Ian is right to raise that as a challenge because that's his role to raise that because we should, you know, a problem not solved in time is, is, a, is another problem. Um, but all I can say is our senior leadership are well aware and they are working through at, their, at each level, at each strategic level, trying to resolve those issues. There is a challenge. Councillor um, Bob, just very briefly, if I just pick up on, on Connor's first first point about um, different models. I suppose really there is only two models, and that's either we're co-located in the same location or we're all in different buildings and we use phone and information systems. And I think on the balance, uh, it's probably to the advantage, isn't it, to be co-located. So, so that you, I, I don't think there's an issue 
you know, in, in serious matters, getting information off somebody else. But if you can just walk walk along the corridor and have a chat with somebody, then I think that develops relationships. And I think the advantages from that uh, outweigh the disadvantages of us all finding somewhere else to go and be and be, and be separate. And I think, you know, that's probably the the rationale at the end of the day. So there's only yeah. two basic things: you're either together or you're not. Thank you for that. Just a couple of questions, if um, I could. I know that Stoke's departure from the MASH was their decision and not ours. Um, however, they must be, they must have some intelligence information. They must bring something to the debate around um, safeguarding. Uh, are we happy that we can fill that gap? Um, a lot of this is about information sharing. And I know you talked about uh, Stoke have now gone, but they're still using a, a, a system of ours. But what happens because of the geography, they sit right in the middle. I can't imagine that safeguarding issues are completely unique to the boundaries of Stoke-on-Trent. So when they go, how do we fill that intelligence and information gap that will be critically important uh, around how we protect some of our young people? I suppose part, part of what you're asking is, uh, you know, do we st still have regular contact with colleagues in Stoke? Are we having daily conversations with them? Yes, we are, because obviously, I'm um, just because of the proximity of, uh, you know, our boundaries. Uh, so relationships with, uh, you know, the social work teams on and front door teams uh, in Stoke-on-Trent are uh, uh, have remain have remained close. I think, uh, I mean. Part of it, it the, the governance arrangements um, are, are one thing, but again, you know, uh, obviously partnership working and keeping those links is is, is vital. Uh, w at the end of the day, we're, they're political boundaries, aren't they? We, we, are, uh, we are all in Staffordshire. Uh, so the, um, obviously, uh, in terms of the partnership within the, the MASH, the police officers which Stoke-on-Trent will do their business with, strategy meetings, information sharing, are the same police that we, that, that we deal with. Uh, so there is a massive crossover. Uh, and, you know, whilst the, some of those practical arrangements are difficult, and I think members will be aware of the arrangements that have been split between Stoke and staffs over a period of time, some of those do remain joined. Uh, and as you say, Stoke remain joined to us at the moment. It, it, although it's only a technical thing, I, I don't, uh, in terms of uh, other gov governance arrangements, I don't necessarily see other managers from Stoke-on-Trent regularly, uh, but there is still that link there, um, uh, you know, with some of those practical arrangements. So I don't think there's anything necessarily lost. Uh, uh, you, you know, if you ask me, would I prefer that, that we, you know, that, that Stoke-on-Trent was still with us and we were working together? I, I would probably say yes, that would be a, a, an advantage and certainly those informal and formal relationships, th there is a link, we're very close to each other, we're facing some of the same issues and uh, we're dealing with the same partnership. Right, that, thank you for that. A um, couple of other things. Um, are we still a mash or are we a massa, I think was the other description. Um, if we have changed the name and excuse me, for being cynical here, but sometimes when things aren't working, organisations just change the name, don't they, and, 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 and move on. Um, I know that you have described this um, partnership working and uh, it sounds fantastic. My only slight concern, and forgive me for this blunt question, but you were talking about certain people coming into the building and we're expecting others to come. The legislation and momentum to jointly work is probably 30 years old. Um, are we late coming to this party? Um, we have to view these things, don't we, in light of other information. I know we've already mentioned the um, independent safeguarding board review that we had last week. I, I think it's fair to say that was incredibly concerning. Uh, it talked about um, not only difficulties with information sharing, it talked about uh, some of the obstacles being some of the partners actively acting against information sharing. I think the words they used were not on, not on board. And I note in this report, or sorry, the first 
draft of the report that I read, uh, I think paragraphs 15 to 19 talk about how we're still trying to decide what the information should be in our information sharing uh, forms, uh, whatever form they take. And it, it just makes me slightly concerned that we've got another report, an independent report that says it's not working particularly well. Uh, this is now 30 years old and we've got a report here that says we haven't quite decided what our information sharing should be at the moment and some of the partners aren't, um, aren't there. I, I hope you can see that that paints a, an overall picture to me that it, it doesn't fill me with a great deal of confidence that we're getting this right. And uh, I know at the moment there's no evidence, as I've just heard, that we have of getting it wrong. But my argument would be how, how would we know that we're not getting it wrong or we are getting it right if we don't have the right structures in place to be able to uh, deal with what are some of the most vulnerable people? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, obviously th th that was one of the reasons I did put in the uh, report about the description about what 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 is what is a mash and because again you you're quite right. I mean, obviously the that concept's been around for uh, uh, you know a certain length of time, uh, and and actually I think uh, uh, as uh, as you will know some of the the reasons for actually putting. Uh, formulating mashes and certainly the the mash in uh, Staffordshire was that uh, difficulty in information sharing and difficulty sharing information between partners uh, the mashes were uh, it initially designed to overcome that that particular problem uh, I can recall being a social worker at that uh, uh, you know previous to that time and sometimes actually information sharing was extremely difficult um, uh, you're quite right. The um, match is being developed through the early 2011. Uh, you know that 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 part of the um, uh, the decade have uh, moved that position on. You know um, uh, beyond all recognition. Uh, I recognise as a, a, a practitioner and actually working in the mash, uh, how much that has actually changed and how much the sort of um, the philosophy of information sharing has become so different. Um, almost to a stage where I suppose some of the, the questions being, po uh, being posed there and being posed by the DFE are, uh, is, is something like MASH still required? Uh, and I guess that's, you know, the question that we're, 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 we're kind of wrestling with to a, uh, uh, to a certain extent. And I, I've wrestled with the idea of whether we still call the MASH a MASH, and it's not my decision at the end of the day, it's a partnership. And uh, I have uh, reflected on certain occasions, is it a building or is it a system? And I think that, you know, the, the, there is a little bit about both of them, really, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, having those effective relationships. Um, so there certainly is no um, intention of changing the name of the, uh, the arrangement at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm minded that within working together, you know, we're now... Uh, looking at multi-agency safeguarding arrangements, uh, but th that doesn't, I suppose, preclude, uh, you know, still having a mash and, you know, still having those arrangements in place. But we might need to look at it in the light of that advice from uh, from DFE. Thank you. That final question, really. Um, uh, one of the slides you, you talked about, about performance data. And, 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 and we've already heard in answer to some questions, certainly about uh, trafficking and other uh, threat and risk that young people face, and not only young people, of course, but um, vulnerable adults. Um, we were recently criticised, weren't we, um, as a children's services, uh, and one of the criticisms was a, a, a lack of data. Um, I know the people who are sitting around here who've heard me before sound like a scratched record around this. But are we happy? Because I, I, I did hear someone say we're absolutely clear about what the threat and risk is and couldn't be better. However, the reports and the independent reviews, uh, Ofsted, of course, um, they've highlighted the fact that our, our data is not up, up to scratch. I just, uh, do you, uh, can you reassure this committee that 
we do have the data that is required to keep people safe. Uh, is it right? Um, do we have the performance indication? Because certainly on the original report that I read, paragraph 22, um, described the data as being difficult to interpret, uh, not understood by all of the partners. Um, uh, and then I think you said uh, that we can demonstrate that we're making a, a real difference. I, I, I just see a bit of a dichotomy there between the two views. Uh, it does concern me that the data isn't quite right. Uh, and I think that was uh, indicated in the first report. I just wonder if there's any reassurance that we do have that data picture right. So I think the data exists on two levels. So obviously the uh, children's services and the children's services element within the MASH, we, uh, the, the data collection there is in terms of uh, care, care director and, 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 the, and those systems. So th those are reported in the same way as other social work teams in the, uh, in the district. Uh, so that's a, by way of a Power BI report and all the, all the rest of it against uh, uh, key performance indicators. Uh, the bit that I've alluded to there in terms of performance was um, information which is extracted from the information sharing log. So referrals will go into children's services. So we accept referrals from all sorts of agencies on the general public and from a variety of, uh, a variety of sources. Some of those... Uh, referrals may not be the subject of necessarily of any information share there's only a certain proportion uh, that are but any that that are subject to information share with partners in that mash environment will be recorded on the um, ISL and that's where we pull that information from it has been a challenge because that was a bespoke computer system that was was developed by uh, Staffordshire County Council ICT but there's a wealth of information in there and actually some of the reports that we've actually been able to pull over the last few months uh, are, are actually quite revealing about what the the difference that MASH is making it's spotting trends and all the rest of it uh, I mean it might be good at some point for me to maybe come back to uh, maybe to this committee and actually present some of that information and uh, perhaps provide some reassurances about that. Thank you for that. I think you anticipated the next question, which was going to be, can we see some of that data? Can we be reassured that we're getting it, uh, getting it right? If I can just add uh, something to the data question. I just want to, Clive did make that difference, but I want to make it very clear because it is related to the Ofsted uh, feedback. Data that is contained within ISL will provide us more information around the success or areas of improvement within the MASH. It will not provide us any statutory data that we need because we already have it. Those, the statutory returns and the information that is required by statute, we have got that. ISL will provide us more in-depth data around the performance of MASH, which, and, and you can always use data to improve, yourself, improve ourselves, but with our front door, the, the statutory information that we need, we are already performing well above our, the national averages and stat neighbors. So our front door is robust and its performance is robust. Within front door, Ofsted made comment about the LADO service, which is a very small service, uh, and that is where we are strengthening our performance indicators and performance reporting. That was, that was the difference. I wanted to make it very clear. Thank you. No, thank you. That, that does clarify um, uh, issues quite well. Um, oh, sorry. Can, uh, Councillor Walmer. Only, only just to come in on the performance piece, but on, in the presentation, I think you mentioned a, a MASH audit uh, that does take place on a regular basis. Um, it might not be for the whole committee to see that, but would it be possible perhaps for the chairman to be able to see a copy of that um, when, when it's published? Yeah, that would be absolutely fine. Uh, so uh, two of those have taken place already. Uh, and uh, like I said, we, we have another uh, 10 planned for the next, uh, for the next 12 months. So, but we can provide some information about that. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Sutton, did you want to finish? Um, Clive, thank you, and uh, Nisha, thank you very much for bringing that in the presentation. It was really, really helpful. Um, 
uh, I, I, I think it does give us some reassurance, like I said before, the fact that Stoke-on-Trent uh, have moved out was not of our making, but it does sound like we have some mitigation in place to make sure that that doesn't have a detrimental effect to uh, the way that uh, we work. Uh, I do look forward to uh, potentially some uh, data and performance information uh, in the future, as I'm sure the rest of the committee uh, do. Uh, and also, can I uh, extend uh, a thank you uh, for your invitation for us to visit the MASH. Uh, I do think that will be a unique opportunity for members in a relaxed atmosphere to actually see the layout of the building, how it works, because uh, at the moment you, you have to try to imagine all of these things and how all the cogs work within that. So uh, I think that will be a really valuable opportunity for us. So thank you for, uh, for that um, invitation. Uh, and thank you, thanks for coming. <laughs> Item uh, five. Unlike Connor, I've forgotten my glasses, so I'm having to. Uh, <laughs> uh, community safety agreement. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, coming along. Um, Councillor Wilson, did you want to open? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members. Um, right, so we're presenting this paper today um, to update members on um, the countywide community safety agreement that we have um, and all the activity relating to the cross-cutting priorities that's being undertaken at the moment. Um, and the report um, in the background section firstly explains that um, a community safety agreement is mandatory um, for, for, for two tier authorities to meet the requirements under the um, Crime and Disorder Act as amended by the Police and Justice Act. The County Council also has um, additional responsibility to provide um, the overarching governments for community safety partnership priorities and it meets this requirement through the Safer and Stronger Community St Str Strategic Group, difficult to say, which I, I actually chair. Um, paragraph eight of the report explains how the partnership cross-cutting priorities are identified, and these are detailed in the report at paragraph nine. These include, amongst others, uh, domestic abuse, counter-terrorism, and serious violence. Contained in the report at paragraphs 10 and 11, members will see that there are some areas that have been identified as locality priorities, where a force-wide partnership approach would help due to levels of crime and disorder. Four districts and boroughs have specific wards where a more holistic approach to crime reduction is required, um, and these have been named in the report. Areas have also been identified as a local priority using the same data that was used to identify force-wide priority localities. Risks in these areas are considered in the context of their local safety partnership area um, and appropriate responses will be included in local policing and local community safety partnership plans. Members will know that the community safety arena has a number of boards um, and very complex governance arrangements. And while there are existing governance arrangements in place to report against those priorities and to hold our partners to account, the aim is to not duplicate the effort um, or reporting wherever possible. So regular updates are provided to the SSCSG for information where governance is through alternative boards. Um, paragraphs 12 to 14 explain that the SSCSG is responsible for monitoring performance and holding partners to account for community cohesion and tackling extremism, for fraud, and for local priorities for East Staffs, Stafford, Newcastle, and Cannock. Um, the report then covers these three areas and paragraphs 15 to 28 refer to the work relating to counter-terrorism. And Staffordshire County Council is a specified authority for tackling 
extremism under the prevent duty and the report explains that the county council's role um, and what that is and advises the priorities and activities taking place against the partnership delivery plan um, to mitigate local threats and um, any risks identified. Paragraphs 29 to 39 of the report advise members that fraud offences are recorded and collated by action fraud at the City of London. Police lead the activity around fraud for Staffordshire and Chief Superintendent Emily McCormack provides the SSCSG with updates in this area. Paragraphs 40 to 43 refer to the four district and borough locality priorities where there is a more holistic approach to policing and each of these areas are required to report progress on performance at SSCSG. In addition, at each meeting, a deep dive into one particular locality's performance takes place. Um, at Appendix 2 of the report, you'll see that um, there was an update provided to us at the last meeting by Cannock District Council, which is very useful. Where there are existing governance arrangements in place to report against these priorities and hold partners to account, as previously mentioned, the aim is not to duplicate effort or reporting wherever possible, but updates are provided to the SSCSG for information. Uh, pa paragraphs 44 to 46 advise which priorities have existing governance arrangements in place and the report details further information regarding these priorities. In terms of um, domestic abuse, you'll see paragraphs 46 to 51 of the report um, do explain the governance arrangements through the DACDB. And members might be aware that um, a recommissioned contract commenced on um, 1st of October last year and a report on progress in this priority will be reported to a future uh, meeting of this committee. However, Appendix 1 of this report shows that the domestic abuse outcomes achieved uh, during the duration of the previous contract, and you'll see those um, in the report. And work relating to serious violence and violence against women and girls is detailed at paragraphs 52 to 58 and the report um, explains how the County Council discharges its statutory responsibility under the Serious, serious, uh, serious Violence Duty. Um, Appendix 3, you'll see, highlights the Violence Reduction Alliance activity to date. <coughs> Antisocial behaviour activity is detailed at paragraphs 59 to 64. Um, and finally, safeguarding vulnerable persons, <coughs> including drugs, alcohol, mental health, um, and child exploitation is covered at paragraph 65 to 68. So in summary, the uh, community safety agreement refers to many aspects of work. The overarching um, governance arrangements of each area are included in this report, together with details of the um, activities being carried out on the partnership prioritized, uh, priorities identified within the CSA. Um, and a copy of the community safety agreement for 23 to 26 is included um, as appendix four to this report. Um, so um, that's it from me. I have um, Trish Caldwell here with me and um, Catherine Mann. And Trish is the County Commissioner for Regulatory Services and Community Safety. Um, so we're happy to take um, questions from the committee as required. No, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for the summary uh, around the report. Um, maybe I could start. Um, paragraph 19, we talked about the CTLP, the counterterrorism local profile. Uh, and I think on paragraph 23, we talked about a 25% conversion rate. I'm not, not quite sure what a conversion uh, rate is. Um, given the fact, though, that uh, our geography... Uh, and also recent history with, uh, and most people will remember, Usman Khan, who has been uh, looked after and managed here in Staffordshire. Um, how, how do we as a crime disorder panel, how, how do we get a, a handle or an understanding of what the terrorism threat and risk picture uh, is? Not that we want great detail, but how do we know if 25% is one out of four, or is it 
25 out of 100, so to speak. I, I, we're just trying to get a handle on where we are in that picture. Uh, how concerned do we need to be, I suppose, is the, is the question. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, if I talk about um, the 25% um, and why we've included that in the report, first of all, because um, as you've alluded to, um, you know, some of this information, uh, we do need to be mindful of the sensitivities, so hence there's not numbers per se included in this report. However, um, what we are aware of um, through our Home Office Regional Advisor, in terms of the work that takes place in Staffordshire to make sure organisations and partners understand signs um, of radicalisation and potential um, issues, that they're very clear on how to refer that through our system. And those referrals uh, go into uh, the police who will look at those and some of them don't need um, a referral in but may need um, you know, something else around it. Um, but a 25% going into that route um, is, is seen to be indicating of our good quality referrals because the ones that we are putting in are ones that um, would benefit from that um, multi-agency um, view of them. Um, and we are aware of um, statistics from our regional neighbours that indicates our success rate, if you like, of having that quality into, yes, this should be, uh, this is one that we should look at, um, is really um, positive. So we tried to include something to give you an indication of assurance that, if you like, the awareness and training means that where those um, referrals are coming in from are of sufficient quality that are being uh, looked at. So that was what we're trying to do with the 25%. I think in terms of the more, the wider question, uh, Chair, around that reassurance around the local threats um, and risk of harm, um, you mentioned the CTRP, the Counterterrorism Local Plan. Um, each year, Counterterrorism Police refresh that and we are about to um, receive, um, as an organisation, an overview of that. Um, we are mindful of making sure that um, yourself as, as chair of this group has some knowledge of that. Uh, so um, this year we've made arrangements to make sure that you are able to see that briefing. So whilst we can't share that, um, publicly, you will, um, from a, if you like, an independent scrutiny perspective, uh, see what uh, Councillor Wilson sees as portfolio holder. Um, so, you know, that, that we can address it through uh, that route. I, no, thank you for that. And I think that um, invitation, I'm very flattered. And uh, I, I think it does, hopefully, will give us some reassurance, at least uh, with whatever I'm shown or whatever I'm told and whatever I'm allowed to say further on. But I think it will put some parameters around what that threat and risk picture looks like because I, I fully accept the argument around we, we now have far better information and the process is better. But if we're saying we're really good at it and we're still doing 25%, that sounds to me like we have a concern that we're absolutely sure of because our intelligence process is right, around one in four people who are referred into us. That can be quite worrying, can't it? And I think what we need to know is actually what, what does that mean? It, you know, like I said before, is it four or is it 400? You know, so I'd, that, I, I think some sort of an understanding around the capacity that we have to deal with that and what the, like I say, that particular threat and risk uh, picture is uh, and I know that they, it's easy sometimes to say oh, we live in Staffordshire this doesn't affect us Staffordshire has some history in this area as I'm sure you'll well know uh, and it isn't just from one end of that threat and risk picture we have the far right 
uh, elements here. And I think it's important that we have an understanding of what that, uh, what that picture looks like. So I am very grateful for that uh, invitation and, and I will, uh, whatever I'm allowed to feedback, I'll feedback to the uh, committee. Councillor Snape. Thank you, Chair. There's the old expression, lies, damn lies and statistics. And when I read a document like this, I accept perhaps you can't put terrorism figures in, but there's no figures. Just to read point 50, uh, 55, no, sorry, 56. SEC discharge its responsibility in respect of uh, serious violence. Uh, Staffordshire Police have ring fenced resources. Is that ring fenced at one officer for the whole of Staffordshire? Ten officers. Uh, we, we talk about uh, rural crime, we talk about theft from vehicles. Is there one in each area? We need to know on this scrutiny committee. What's happening across the county? So we can judge it by last year, we can judge it by next year, we can see how it's moving forward. At the moment, it's just a totally bland report. I'm sorry to say, Chair, it means nothing really. I'm sorry. I mean, I know you spoke about data on the last issue, but it's exactly the same on this. We've been given reports which are meaningless, really, because we've got nothing to measure them against. So, did you want to reply to that, Tricia? Yes, um, if I pick up, pick up first. So in terms of statistics around um, rural crime, um, car thefts, et cetera. Well, all the time, I've got issues Yeah, time, yeah, all the time. yeah. So um, I believe um, the police and crime panel is um, the place where that is, is we reviewed. Don't to come to and then um, if I... Maybe that's an issue then for me to take up and to figure out. I, I don't want to put you on... Uh, on the spot, I take uh, Paul's point. Uh, and then I'll, um, I'll I'll raise some issues about what that what that looks like. In the meantime, just a couple of um, of the things as well within the report. Um, it, you set out some priorities of offences. I, I I've lost my glasses, so I'm struggling here. But I think it's page 20. It starts with domestic violence. Um, how, how have we come to the conclusion that those are the priorities? Um, I'm sure Councillor Wilson will know, but in South Staffs, and I don't want this to be a parochial examination of what we all suffer from, but uh, in South Staffs, our biggest problem is domestic burglaries and thefts of usually very expensive cars. Um, they don't appear on here. So I assume this is a priority for the whole of Staffordshire as it, as it should be. So two questions really. What happens to those areas that don't share these priorities? And also I noticed that there are four areas that we need to concentrate on because they have uh, problems. Um, thankfully, none of those are South Staffordshire. But, and I, I, again, I don't want to be the vanguard for South Staffordshire, but there will be other areas, won't there? Is there a sense of those areas missing out because resource is being sent to the four that need it? And also, are the specific issues of those areas being addressed? Because this feels like a bit of a broad brush approach to what's happening in Staffordshire, and it might not be reflective of what's happening in local areas. I, I hope some of that made some sense. <laughs> So if I may respond in the, in the first instance, and I know Councillor Wilson uh, will also respond. So in terms of the community safety agreement that you're looking at here, that really reflects cross-cutting priorities. And how we get to those priorities is we use the strategic assessments. Now, there's a, a community safety strategic assessment produced for each of our district areas and boroughs. So South Staffordshire and every other district and borough will have um, that strategic needs assessment for their specific area. And the community safety partnership in those districts and boroughs will absolutely use that. And so, for example, I'll stick with the South Staffordshire example, that the CSP will be really clear on what the priorities are in their locality, which will feature um, thefts from motor vehicles, theft of motor vehicles, etc. And they will have a local priority plan to, uh, you know, um, try and work to reduce those 
uh, those threats with the partnership approach. So the police have a the local police and have a role in that, as do the local authority, as do um, others, other partners. So the community safety agreement uh, that you see here is looking at across the piece um, with our insight colleagues to identify, um, for example, domestic abuse features in every local or, uh, local authority district and borough so that is a cross-cutting authority that absolutely is a county-wide priority and the county-wide priorities that are reflected in the agreement therefore are ones that affect either all or the vast majority of districts i accept that not every district might see it individually as a priority but overall it's a cross-cutting one um, so that's how they end up in there but rest assured each um, authority has its own plan with its own priorities. Um, in terms of the four areas that we mention in here, um, they are ones where there's specific wards that have been identified through uh, you know, the policing model with all their crime factors that actually would benefit from a more holistic approach. However, that doesn't mean if you're not mentioned in there either as a, you know, as a district that there are not local plans with local policing because that information's been mapped across. Um, and it, again, in the strategic assessment, um, the level of detail not included in this uh, paper, there are areas named that are of concern, of big enough concern that feature locally where local plans should be in place. And again, that information's been shared across with every district and borough CSP. Um, so whether it's local policing resourcing it as a local policing issue, or whether it is um, being addressed by a partnership approach, then the policing have resource in each of the areas, which I think is a concern that you raised. Do you want to? No, thank you for that. That, uh, that makes okay. sense, yes, thank you. Uh, I do apologise, Councillor Pardeshi, you indicated earlier I, uh, I ran away with myself. Thank you, Chair. Um, my concerns, Chair, around the PREVENT programme are well documented, so I won't go over that again. Um, under community cohesion, um, I'm aware that part of my duty as a councillor is if there are any divisions or tensions among um, communities, part of my role is to de-escalate the situation, um, do everything I can to calm things down and, and bring communities together. And we, well, uh, I'm assuming uh, and hope we expect that also of our staff and members of uh, organizations and communities. Um, however, there are times when um, inadvertently or deliberately, our local politicians will make comments and behave in such a way that isn't helpful to situations. So is it um, uh, appropriate to say something about um, the crucial role that councillors, local politicians, whoever, have to play as far as community cohesion goes and how important their role is in bringing communities together. So I just wondered if, if it was appropriate or uh, uh, the right place to bring something in like that uh, in such a report. Thank you, Chair. No, I, I completely agree. I think perhaps we should have uh, a openly stated objective of, around how local elected members do, precise, do precisely that. But maybe that's a conversation that we can have um, outside the meeting. Did you want to reply, no, Victoria? Yeah, um, I do believe that councillors, local politi politicians are that bridge, aren't they, between members of the public um, and... Um, County Council, District Council, and all our partners, and of course, you know, our role is to is to be that liaison and to have that relationship and to try and foster um, strength in communities. Absolutely, um, we do have a community strategy. Um, we have um, gone public with a, a, um, 
a survey that's gone out asking people what it is that's important to them. Um, and perhaps that sort of question can be tied into to that community strategy area of things. Obviously, criminal activity is another matter altogether um, and not something that I would recommend that members um, get in the middle of. I think you're right. And I think the community strategy is a really useful way forward. And from what I've seen, um, it, it looks very good. Uh, but until you just mentioned it, I do think perhaps an overt statement about, you know, I know it's stating the obvious about what we should be doing as local elected members, but um, I, that may well be um, a very useful thing to include. Councillor Ed Geller. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for your presentation, Victoria, and uh, the other lady. <laughs> um, a couple of questions, actually. You've done a deep dive into Cannock. Uh, and I, I understand looking at this, so, uh, Stafford South is a uh, high area. Um, when we Have you done Stafford South or is it likely or Stafford to be done in the near future? And if, when, where and uh, when is the meeting to take place? Because I would like to sit in the background if possible. And the next question is, talking about safer streets on page 36, um, how much is that funding that's given uh, to different boroughs? Um, because I, I, I've had a, yeah, uh, last Sunday night I was out there putting solar panel, uh, solar lights on a house because we got a, a very dark alleyway and it wanted lighting up, but nobody would fix them. So, uh, with the help of my husband and somebody else, we got them fitted and it's working very well and the neighbours are very pleased about it. But, uh, I just asking the question, how much is fun, how much fund is given to each borough? Thank you. Okay, um, first question's easier than the second one to answer, so um, I'll take them in that order. Um, in terms of um, Stafford South, um, it will be not the meeting that is coming up for Safer and Stronger next, which is um, a few weeks away. It will be the one afterwards. The reason I can be so definite about that is um, our plans were to have Stafford as the next one following Cannock. Unfortunately, the chief in inspector that we need is away on leave. So he's, he's penciled in now to come to the one uh, that follows that meeting. So I'll provide you with the date after this meeting. I can, I can make sure that you're included on the, on the invite oh, list. Yeah, because yeah, it's, the, it's the safer and stronger meeting that um, that will be featured at. Oh yes, and then the funding. Um, Safer Streets has been um, in a number of bids that the um, Commissioner's Office, the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office has put forward. So um, I will need to um, advise you of those amounts um, separately um, of the totals of, the, of how much they were, but they were also successful for some areas there's some criteria that had to be met to be able to be eligible for a bid um, so um, just just to note that not every district was able to have safer streets funding um, or even the safer the, there's some of funding around the violence against women and girls funding as well uh, there was particular criteria to be met um, but the Police and Crime Commissioner led on bids and they were successful in a number of them in a number of districts. But apologies, I just don't have the exact amount uh, to hand, but I can, I can provide that after the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Snow. To assist on that one, perhaps, I was with Ben Adams the other day uh, and I think the total figure is over £2 million. Wow. And Kanaka were given 554000 So we're talking big sums, really. And I think that just went to four different areas, didn't it? So yeah. we're talking very, very big sums, really, to try and solve problems. In the Commissioner's bid, um, Stoke were featured in that as well. So Stoke were one of those areas, but I certainly know that Stuff, some of the Staffordshire districts were, were successful as well. And, and it's been different districts in different levels of, of funding. Um, but I, I just haven't got the detail on the latest funding that uh, his team was successful in getting. I'll, I'll look forward to South Staff's share of whatever, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, 
Finally from me, the um, paragraph, I think it was section 60, you talked about uh, missing children and exploited uh, children, something that um, is close to us geographically uh, here, um, and it is a constant concern and worry. I, I am trying to avoid not using the, um, the independent review of safeguarding board report that we had last time as a stick to beat everyone who sits in those three chairs. Uh, but it did paint some really concerning and worrying pictures for us. And it talked about, uh, uh, you will have heard from the previous debate, um, a, a, a lack of commitment from various partners, um, a lack of information sharing. Um, how, how much could you reassure this group uh, that in light of that report, that we have a good understanding of potential abuse and exploitation of young children here, here in Staffordshire. Um, it does talk about how we tattle the issue, but um, like I say, in light of this report, how do we, what reassurance can we have that, you know, we're not a Telford in waiting, um, and we, if the telltale signs, and, and it's not just exploitation, but we hear that Staffordshire is probably the sort of area you would ha have things um, sort of, you know, uh, drug selling, board, cross-border um, stuff. How do, how, how do we know that we, we've got a handle on um, some of that threat and risk? So um, we've mentioned in the report that um, there's um, a children's safeguarding scrutiny and assurance partnership um, and those are the people that are that have the governance for that. So it's probably appropriate that the question would be asked of them. Um, at, but we do also receive a report on that at my um, Safer and Stronger strategy group as well. Thank you uh, for that. One of the slight problems, though, is whenever there's another group that have the answer, we don't have access to them in a public forum like this. So uh, it is perhaps something that we might need to give some more thought to how do we reassure the public that hopefully are watching uh, this and tuned in as we speak uh, to give them some uh, reassurance around that. Uh, Councillor Gelly. Thank you, Chairman. You just read the thought in my head, actually. You know, we've got a lot of uh, children that leave care and go into the community living, looking after themselves as they've left care. Um, and some of them probably have got uh, issues where they're on disability allowance or what's, you know, so they've got money coming in. How do we tr protect these vulnerable young people from the trolls of this world that probably latch onto the idea that they've got money coming in, they're vulnerable because they've probably got not family around them or anything. How can we protect these young people so they're not exploited by the drug people, shall we say. You know, how can we look after these young... Uh, it's just a question, I, I, and it's a very difficult question probably to answer, but do we keep an eye on these young people as they've gone out into society living on their own and they are receiving, say, disablement allowance or that the drug people do not uh, find this out and then are taking the money off them and using them in the drug trade? Because we know it does happen. Thank you. It's a very good question, Anne. Um, and I mean, you and I sit on the corporate parenting panel, don't we? And we look at care leavers. Um, and I know that we look after people until they're 25 now, don't we? Um, but this isn't, a, this isn't a one agency approach. This is a, a multi-partnership approach that we have to take into account in terms of keeping our young people and young, young adults safe. And it's a very valid question. I, if, if, if it's any uh, reassurance, um, I, I, I speak to uh, not only our local police, but also the commissioner's office um, sit on various uh, panels around governance of the police. And from my 30 years experience, I have to say, Stafford should do this very well. Um, uh, in fact, they do it better than most police forces I've, I've ever experienced. Um, uh, and so I, I, I do think we have something of a handle on it. My real concern, though, is around some of these specific issues. 
certainly in light of that previous report that says we don't have the data or the information sharing. Uh, that is a slight worry because we don't know what we don't know, do we? You know, so I think that's something that we probably need uh, an answer to. Uh, Councillor Snape, I think you've got the last question. I'm just basically going to say what Victoria has really just said there, that we are responsible now for children from past legislation until we're 25. Mm. It's really whether that falls into adult service to look at or still children's services. And what is the cross between the two, really? I mean, I'm not expecting you to answer that. We just think we, we really need to perhaps look at. But I agree with what Bob says, though. We are, or the chairman says, sorry, that we, we, we do really look after our people very, very well. And uh, but there is good liaison with the police service. Uh, perhaps better now we, we've had uh, Chris Noble as chief constable mm. and the change in the senior officer structure across the force, really. So uh, I think we are moving forward, perhaps a bit slower than perhaps we wanted to. But as long as we get right at the end, it doesn't really matter how slow we go, we're getting there, and that is what matters. Uh, Councillor Wilson, did you want to finish? Or? Really, I need to thank you, Chairman, for asking us to bring this report to you today, and any questions that we have to answer, we will get back to you on. Um, I sh understand the frustration that um, with this very sensible subject, there is information that can be shared and information that cannot. Um, but I think that, that the overriding reassurances is, is that, you know, there are people that are um, aware of where we are and how we're doing and that scrutiny is, is here under this um, community safety agreement within the County Council. Thank you. I, I think just on that point as well and from my previous experience, um, I was Head of Governance over the Counter-Terrorism Local, they used to call Local Profiles, I understand they call Local Plans. Uh, now, and uh, I have received an invitation to uh, have a redacted uh, look at one uh, one of those, and I would just finish on the fact that wouldn't have happened ten years ago, uh, and I think that is a reflection of uh, open and transparency uh, around a whole host. And to thought ten years ago that an elected member with a political interest would be able to see something like that would have been unheard of. So I do think that's a real positive uh, step forward. I haven't seen it yet, it might all be redacted out, hasn't it? but, but I, I, I think in principle the fact that uh, I've at least been offered, um, and, and thank you uh, for sorting that out, that's, uh, that, that's been really helpful. Thank you for coming. Um, hour and a half now, people just want a bit of a stretch of legs, get a drink, um, back at quarter to.
thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Um, can I start by a congratulations to uh, Councillor uh, right there? Um, I think it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. In far grander political surroundings than this, I think they call it crossing the floor, don't they, I think, so. Um, so uh, <laughs> um, right, the uh, Safeguarding Overview Unit Scrutiny uh, Committee, uh, early response in adult safe uh, safeguarding. <coughs> Council Wilcox, did you want to open? Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be here this morning. It, it's, this is where I, I cut my teeth, in a sense. The first committee I ever went on was safeguarding, and uh, I'm sort of on the other side of the fence now. So, But I, ha I have a real um, love for the committee and the work that you do and the importance that you put to it. Um, and and I've, I've tried to be persuading other chairs that the, the pre-meet that you conduct, I think, is really, really valuable to us as members. In, in making sure we've got all the right information and, and that ready to do. Um, I'm ably assisted today um, by Ruth Martin, who's the um, principal social worker and safeguarding lead, and of course, Councillor Paul, uh, North Holt, Northcott, sorry, Paul. Get it right. I'll get it right eventually. <laughs> who is, who, as you know, is our lead on safeguarding. So, Paul, <laughs> I'm here to support. So, Paul will, will, will open up and then uh, we'll have some information from Ruth, if that's okay with you, Chair. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, uh, committee members. Um, a, a very short report this morning, but to give you some uh, um, background about what we've been doing and to uh, consider the early response of the adult uh, safeguarding concerns and the steps uh, taken uh, by ourselves to reduce the delays. You'll see from the paper that um, we've been doing some work in the transformation project um, has now come to a close and um, has improved significantly um, and I'll hand over to, to Ruth in a minute um, to describe that in more detail but also um, that we've put in those improvements but there's also work that we're doing with providers um, to shorten the, 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 uh, the demand times even further um, for example sort of filtering and triaging those concerns that are um, that are known, from known concerns, perhaps for for those residents that are already in domiciliary care, uh, and those that uh, are sort of meeting that safeguarding threshold in terms of triggering that response, um, and, and sort of looking at the way that it's that we can understand the high proportion of where the concerns are coming from from the initial decision making and, and, and make some movement in terms of. Uh, addressing those in a, in a, in a priority um, in terms of a flow chart and joint work with the um, Staffordshire County Council uh, quality team. But there's also going to be work, which you'll see in the paper chair, that not only have we been working with the social work teams, but we'll also be doing um, safeguarding training um, that's been refreshed and relaunched in areas where we think that that um, quality assurance framework needs to be updated. Um, following on from that, there's going to be uh, changes that we're going to be implementing in the future um, that, that sort of we're considering a new MASH arrangement or whatever name that that's going to be adopted um, going forward uh, and, and, and remain sort of co-located with Staffordshire Children and Family Services, which we hope will enhance the, um, the service going forward. So that's the, that's the brief background. Um, that we, we're doing to take to reduce the risks and ensure that concerns get the right response uh, at the earliest opportunity. I'll hand over now to my uh, colleague to the right. Ruth will give you some more detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me yet again. I did start by saying before the meeting that actually I'm so worried you're going to be sick of seeing me. You saw me at the last meeting, and I think you're getting me next time when we're going to be focusing more on the uh, development of the adult smash as well. So hopefully we can save sort of some of those discussions around that work going forward for when I'm here uh, next time. But obviously questions that you got from me will most probably help me in my preparations for that as well. So I accept that. 
Um, I also wanted to start by um, thanking you all um, over the last couple of years for your scrutiny over the work that we've been doing uh, within the safeguarding uh, service in, in, in Staffordshire Adults. Uh, services, I've actually found real benefit in coming here and understanding actually the focus, the different focus that you're able to give me um, uh, as, as a, you know, sort of a, in my role and helping me to encourage as well um, the staff within my teams. I must also express my thanks for the work that they've been doing. It isn't me doing the work, it really is my team that have worked so hard uh, to move things forward. And even through, from what you know, there's been some really difficult times where we've been really up against it, they have remained motivated and also uh, keen to ensure that the adults in Staffordshire are getting the right response. And I think it is that work that has helped us uh, to be able to move forward. They have been creative in their thinking as to how we can work in different ways um, uh, to um, um, review uh, those concerns um, that come through to us um, in the most appropriate way, reducing um, uh, concerns being repeatedly looking at, which sometimes when you're triaging, when you've got lar large numbers, you're looking at things multiple times but not really doing a lot with them. So they've been able to review that, understand that, change their practices, which means that as they're looking at something, they're making that decision in a much more timely way, so from working on it. That has led to us being able to um, reduce, as it were, any backlog or work in progress um, from around 800 down to, um, well, in December it was 120. We're a little bit above that now. Um, I'm always honest with you. We've had a very busy couple of months, and unfortunately those numbers have crept up to near on 200. However, there's plans in place and how they're working through that. I'm confident that as our numbers stabilise again, hopefully we'll reduce those numbers down. But you might recall back in the early days, we set the target of 300. So we are actually well below that still anyway. So we're conscious of that, but that doesn't mean that we rest on our laurels and go, oh, it's all right, we're not at 300. So hopefully we start to do, um, start, we're making sure that we're reducing the risk of that happening. Because the last time I presented this, um, and I, I do apologize because I can't remember which councillor here suggested it, it was around how are we going to make sure we're not in the same position again? What um, plans are we going to put in place to prevent us from going up to those numbers going forward? And it was actually that committee meeting that led to us putting in um, our, uh, we've got a, um, uh, a uh, oh, words just gone out of my head, a, um, not flow chart. it's not a flow chart. It's a plan we've got for when our numbers start to increase that we can enact um, other aspects of work to quickly reduce that work. Oh, my goodness. Business continuity plan. Oh, my goodness. I do apologise. Bear with me. Um, so our business continuity plan, which has then been uh, shared with our teams because we're reliant on additional support when we need it, potentially pulling on our, on our other resources from our teams. We haven't had to enact that yet, but actually knowing then that we've got that will hopefully mean we don't find ourselves in such a significant position going forward. What we have also been doing is working on the sort of root of the problem with regards to the types of concerns that we've got coming uh, through to us. As you can see in the report, 48% of that is often from our providers, so that's our care homes and our care agencies within Staffordshire, which is absolutely right. And it's, you know, they're, they're always going to be uh, the, um, um, they're always going to be referring in those higher numbers. But we have been working, as has already been said, to provide them with flow charts and with tools that can help them to be able to make an appropriate decision as to whether something does need to come through. And by using those tools, they can use that as evidence to CQC to say that they followed appropriate protocols when determining not to refer into safeguarding. That hopefully, through the sessions we've been doing with them, um, helps to uh, in increase their confidence to follow that and not just, as I see it sometimes, as we all do, covering their own backs by referring that in. So hopefully we can reduce some of that so we can spend our time, um, um, you know, working on areas um, that, are more, that are more significant. 
Alongside that, which I actually haven't put in the report, we are developing an online portal for providers, we might put it in later, um, an online portal for providers so that actually they make the referrals electronically. Going forward as well, that should then enable us to be able to quickly put that into the right either quality process or a request for an assessment as opposed to it coming uh, to safeguarding in the first instance. So we're starting that, that's work in progress at the moment, that's being built at this time. We're starting with providers, but going forward it will go out as well to members of the public who will be able to use the portal, adults themselves obviously, and then uh, uh, as well our um, emergency services who do struggle because of um, obviously working out of hours. Um, for me, what's been really important as well is to uh, look at the training availability for our social work teams and to have it when we have had that refresh of safeguarding. Going on from that as well, we are also developing an online training platform, which I'm hoping that you will all um, mm. take note of and complete the online training that will be available for adult safeguarding. Hopefully then that will also give you some insight um, into that. Um, that's not to say that we're not happy for you to come and join our, our, um, our other sessions, but that first training, I think, would be really helpful and beneficial for you. So as soon as that's out there, we're obviously having that built into our systems, and that will be available through the Learning Hub, um, as all training is. We're also hoping to make... Um, that mandatory, that's going to take a bit of time for us to be able to do, and we will need to get some of that to, across the whole of the County Council. But that's something that I'm really keen on making sure that all people who work for the uh, County Council have that awareness of adult safeguarding. Um, as I've said, we have got those upcoming um, changes. Oh, I missed out about the quality assurance framework. This is actually a key part for our CQC preparation, that we made sure we had an up-to-date um, quality assurance framework and we've actually made the decision, because we think that that's appropriate, to do that um, uh, quality assurance framework so it can be used by all agencies. So not just us as a local authority, but that actually we're almost saying to other people, this is our expectations of you, either in providers or in our NHS and our health colleagues, police, West Midlands Ambulance Service, etc., to try and make sure that actually everybody in Staffordshire knows what quality safeguarding response for adults looks like and what the expectation is on them, and also what they can expect from us as a local authority as well. So, as I've said, there are some things um, uh, coming, coming in um, further to that. We have um, made our safeguarding forms, the way we record safeguarding inquiries. We, are, we have altered that so it's less bureaucratic, and we're having new forms developed around that so that people can record proportionate and timely safeguarding inquiries. That is going live by March. We had the forums for practitioners to bring those in. They started this week and it was well received. Um, and we're also um, looking at bringing in uh, the, the other change for our teams that we've brought in is enabling them when they've dealt with a safeguarding, a low level um, um, isolated incident through say a review for example if they've identified <coughs> an issue with a provider but they've dealt with that um, as part of their review that they can record that on, on a safeguarding contact so that we've got a record of it but that it doesn't need to ra be raised and go through that process because there's no ongoing risk that's got safeguards in it as it were itself because it will be signed off by a manager and also we will be doing audits of those to make sure that all of those are going to be done appropriately. As I said at the start as well, um, most importantly is the development of the adults only MASH following the changes at the MASH which I'm, I'm, I could hear um, from the children's colleagues that obviously they've brought you up to speed on some elements of that. Um, but I will be um, coming to the next committee to talk through that. Um, but hopefully um, this shows um, the uh, work that we've been doing and actually the, the improved position we are from maybe when I first came and spoke with this committee um, almost two years ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I suppose the first question really, um, I'm, I'm not a fan of the two phrases, but... Um, is this transactional or is it transformational, this, this increase that we've seen? Have we simply bought more of what we usually do or have we made those changes that mean we've made a transactional, a transformational 
change to the way that we deliver the service. Therefore, it's more sustainable and we can maintain this good performance. To, to move from, I think it was 50% to 80%, uh, it's quite a meteoric leap, isn't it? Um, and, you know, I, 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 it's good. And even if we've just paid for that, then it's still good. But it would be really pleasing if that was a result of some sort of transformational change. Thank you. I think that's a, that is the perfect question to be asked. <laughs> um, so, I can sit here and say that we have the same staffing levels now as we did back in August. That isn't to say that all of those are permanent staff. So, we have had um, for a number um, of months, actually for nearly two years, the use of agency and additional resources within the team. We still have that, although that is reduced now, and it was reduced from August. Um, but it is the same amount of staff that I've got in as I had in August to where I'm at now. It has been because of the changes that we've made to practice. And I, I, I don't want to sort of confuse people, but for us it's been about the timeliness of response. So we've given them time scales in which they have to make a decision within. So actually for them then, they're not trying to do additional research. They will then make a decision on what they have available. And what's been really interesting, we are doing audits around this, is that what we've been able to show is that actually our quality of decision making seems to be as it was as well in August, which is equally as good. They're not just working quicker and, and you know, re we're reducing quality. That's not to say we don't have quality concerns that we're addressing. But actually what they're doing is they are making that decision as we should do in a proportionate time scale based on proportionate information. So we're not dragging ourselves, which we were, into the realm of full inquiries when uh, the role of SAST is decision making and immediate risk assessment. So we hopefully have done that more transformational work rather than that transactional um, response. Because I am also aware that the agency staff we've got in now are only temporary and at any point that money that we've currently got won't be available. So I have asked for some work to be done by the team, uh, by the managers um, over at the team to let me know the, the potential impact of that if we mm -hmm. were to suddenly withdraw all of that support because for me that could be have a significant impact. Um, and I want to see what that will be, both from a numbers perspective, but more importantly, from that timeliness of, of, of response. Thank you for that. Um, also, uh, I, 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 as we've been told previously in other reports, that um, the adult safeguarding world is, it is different to children, isn't it? And, you know, we, we have greater responsibilities um, around that. And, and, and forgive me if I oversimplify what I understand is the decision-making process, but doesn't it start off with someone identifies uh, an adult that potentially has a safeguarding need, but then there's another limb that says if we are satisfied that individual can look after themselves, then we, we, we don't have to intervene. There's all sorts of ECHR requirements as well, isn't there, around, around that. When you talk then about getting the performance much better and putting a constraint of time on people, is there a temptation for people to say, yeah, they do need it, but I think they can look after themselves? You know, so uh, are, are we seeing an increase in the number of people that are being judged to be able to take care of themselves then for not needing it? If we are, does that point towards too much time pressure and uh, perverse decision making? Or are we seeing none of that and actually we think our decision making is generally much better? Um, I'll start by saying actually the reason, uh, given certainly at the decision making point, uh, because it's the, the uh, Care Act states that one of the reasons as to why we might not make inquiries is because the person is able to protect themselves from the abuse or the neglect. Actually, that's really low for us from a decision-making point because we do record why 
and we're not making the inquiries. And one of those is because the person's able to protect themselves. It's actually, um, I think, less than 2% for us as a reason for closure. It's a very low, because actually, based on information, I think it's really difficult if you've never met the person or you haven't spoken with them at that point, you haven't been able to have those conversations, to be able to state that they're able to protect themselves, particularly if they've got need for care and support. Through our auditing process, so that happens each month, so the team audit a number of cases of each practitioner, and they do um, two that have gone forward, two that have been closed, to be able to see as to whether that decision-making is sound and based on good evidence, because that's what we have to justify our, our decision-making. Now, I don't have any indication at this point that there's been any increase, but we will be monitoring this. We are aware that by, as you say, making people do things in a timely way, it can make people make more decisions. I would say we're more likely to put something through now than potentially we were before because we haven't got that clarity. So actually... That's more of the worry, and that's more of the worry of my area team colleagues, is that they're worried we'll actually put more forward for inquiry than we have been. But I think it's a good point for us to be mindful of, and I wouldn't want us to be making judgments on people's ability to protect themselves without that being clearly identified. I, I, I think that's incredibly reassuring, to be honest. Um, the fact that it is so low anyway, uh, I'd just provide us, because I think there is that worry, isn't there? Uh, especially if you make a, a judgment that someone can protect themselves, you're also making a judgment that we are happy, in inverted commas, that they live in a, a, an abusive situation. Happy probably isn't the right word, but, but we, you know, we, we accept a certain level of abuse for other people because we think, you know, and I just wonder what that sort of longitudinal risk assessment is, because you might be able to protect yourself today, but... Who knows if you elderly in 12 months' time, can you still do the same? And, you know, do, uh, do we have that? Uh, Councillor Northcott. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. I, and I think that the, the critical, one of the critical things here is the work that we're doing with providers um, to, to, to weed out the ones that don't need that ongoing safeguard concern. You know, for, for example, the falls or a, a simple medication error where it can be addressed and, and tackled and more importantly, recorded in, uh, in the decision-making process for evidence, the CQC, etc. cetera. And, and by doing that, it frees up the time to deal with the ones that really need that, that ongoing intervention. So I think it's important to understand that that work with providers is vitally important, that we get that buy-in and we get that cooperation because that will have a significant uh, impact on the numbers coming through and how we address that. Uh, Ruth? Can I just come back as well on that point that you just raised about what no, level of acceptance? We, none of us, I think, have a level of acceptance about abuse and neglect for anybody. Um, but what we also make sure we're looking at when we're doing our audits is where something has been closed, that any other necessary steps have been taken. So for the, some of those situations, it might not be us and they might not want us involved. And quite often it is because as well that the adult themselves are saying, I don't need your support, I'm perfectly capable. That doesn't mean that we will just take their word for it. If we've got concerns, we will still make those inquiries. But there might be other agencies. We might be giving people advice and guidance at that point to be able to seek support from relevant agencies as well. So it could be that actually that might be domestic abuse. Quite often it's domestic abuse. But then there could be drug and alcohol support. Um, it could be support from um, our police colleagues um, or from um, some of the uh, wider sort of crime agencies, particularly where people have been victims of scams, etc. And we do also uh, utilise our, um, our own internal um, trading standards service to go out there and provide some of that advice and guidance to people who have been victims of scams, etc. Okay, that's, uh, that's a real clarification. Yeah, Councillor Snape. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ruth and team. I'd like to thank you for the report. It's got data in, which I always <laughs> like to have in. <laughs> yeah, you've got data. <laughs> but, but you tell us it, warts and all. Like how the figures gone up, they went down, they've gone up again. And the way you present the report, you, you give us all the facts, you speak through it in such a, a brilliant way. So. I mean, I've got no questions about the report itself, just to say thank you for it, but the way you do it. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
It looks like it's all me, I'm afraid. So uh, the next one, um, uh, just really just to finish, is um, I, I, it, it's very impressive, uh, the increases, the way we look after people and talking about that partnership work. Um, in a previous report, though, we were given some stats that tended to suggest that there's a massive misrepresentation amongst some ethnic minority groups. Um, what work are we doing to, un, you know, to know what we don't know, so to speak? Uh, because it's fine if we are saying these are the referrals that are coming in and this is the way we're dealing with them and we all pat ourselves collectively on the back and quite rightly so. But we also have information that tends to suggest there's a hidden problem somewhere, uh, somewhere else. And uh, do we have a responsibility to go seeking that? Uh, how, how do we do it? I, I, I've talked previously about ECHR considerations. There is, you know, right to privacy, right to all of those things, right to a family life. Um, how, do, how, do, how do we approach that? Because when these things go wrong, it's less likely to be with people we know and we've got something in, pl in place. It'll be a history that comes to light after of someone that escaped through the net we didn't know, but we did know that there was a problem somewhere in those, those groups of people. Thank you, thank you again for, for, for that question. Um, so actually, uh, following on from our board work, uh, where we have been actually looking at um, that sort of hidden abuse um, elements, I actually have a meeting this afternoon to review some of our recent auditing that we've done and also our data collection, um, because we are aware that we've got significant, some, I don't wanna say significant, but we've got some of those gaps throughout our data and our awareness. So we wanted to start from the point where we're really clear over what we know we know, and hopefully by knowing what we know, oh, I'm gonna get myself confused <laughs> now. Do you, know what you mean? Do you know what I mean? We can then start to identify what we think we don't know, and those areas that we then need to go out and find out about. So we are aware already of the inaccessibility of our information about safeguarding. So we know that, but what we don't know is how best we should approach making that more accessible. Because I think, as I said, uh, I might have said it here, I don't know, I've spoken uh, quite a lot about this lately, um, is it isn't as simple as putting it into other languages or, you know, changing the format. It's about understanding how safeguarding adults needs to be communicated to different communities, particularly those communities that we don't currently reach. And I'll, I'll mention, um, say, our gypsy traveling communities and also some of our um, Eastern European communities as well that we have growing um, in Staffordshire. So we need to try and understand that. I, what I don't want to do, and what we're really clear we don't want to do, is have almost a knee-jerk reaction to this of just trying to get out there. We want to do this in, in the right way to see how then we can maybe do almost some co-production work around this to actually start engaging with the communities it, uh, you know, that, that we don't currently and understand from their perspective before we, rather than us telling people what we think they should know. So there's work in progress. My first meeting's this afternoon, so maybe next time I'll be able mm -hmm. to give you an update. Uh, no, thank you for that. And I think it's really encouraging that we've at, re at least recognised that. I think um, we all accept there are some huge difficulties in, uh, in, in how you do it. And that sounds like a scratch record. Uh, ECHR considerations must be uh, paramount uh, when we do this. Uh, but it is, um, I, I thought it was an excellent report. I, I agree, uh, you know, with uh, Councillor Snape. Uh, we do prefer warts and all and facts and figures because it just gives that context, doesn't it, and that ability. And, and also to hear the explanations uh, from mainly uh, two colleagues here about um, some of these improvements. And I think, you know, we shouldn't overlook uh, just how big those improvements are. And it's even more encouraging to understand that they're probably going to be transformational and we can look forward to that in the future and it's sustainable. Um, and also for me, that sort of small percentage that of people that were making a judgment about the fact they can protect themselves is so small that it really reassures me that we, we don't use that as a, a quick exit to get the figures up, you know. So 
Um, all in all, I, I, I find it a really useful report and very helpful and, and reassuring. Councillor Edgar. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, just a little bit of, um, if you can help in a situation like this. If you know that somebody is hoarding and uh, as a councillor, you know that that house is, you know, and the lady or the gentleman living there is a certain age that they, you know, they're getting, shall we say, getting on. Um, but, you, but they've got their privacy, you know, so you know there's a problem but what how do you tackle it what do you yeah so if you could help i would appreciate that thank you so hoarding can be a sign obviously of self-neglect it isn't always we have to be mindful that not always if somebody's hoarding is that a sign of self-neglect but hoarding is also recognized as a potential indication of a mental health need as well so for me, it is about making the appropriate referral. So I would be sort of recommending in that, in that case and referring that through to Staffordshire Cares. I might be tempted, if it was me, um, to refer that through as a safeguarding concern in the first place, and then somebody can make the necessary inquiries. We have to remember that with safeguarding, and I heard the conversation earlier about information sharing, when can we share information, when we're concerned that there's an adult is at risk of abuse and neglect and self-neglect comes under that. We are able to share that information without concern. And even when, and we, I have had to deal with it, where adults themselves are upset that somebody has referred into us, but actually, you know, by explaining to people that if then they choose not to be involved with us, what we're here to do is just to offer that support and that actually people are there because they're concerned. It isn't a malicious um, response. Um, but I always encourage that where you have those concerns that actually you do raise them because then it might not need a safeguarding uh, concern. And in the first instance, for most people, it's that assessment and care management response that's required, and uh, certainly in those circumstances, because uh, otherwise safeguarding can be a bit of a disproportionate response. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, it, it's just, uh, you know, accepting that people have got their privacy and it's a, yeah big concern thank you I think part of the problem is that's how it differs from child safeguarding isn't it you know that um, hoarding isn't a, an offense is it and you know you can hoard I should see one of the bedrooms at mine so but, um, can I just say um, if there's no other questions thank you very much for coming uh, it, as ever it's always reassuring oh sorry uh, Paul I've uh, thanks, Chairman, and, and thanks to the members of the committee because you've helped to shape this mm. going forward by asking those questions that have perhaps been very difficult. And I think, you know, the approach by, uh, by the team is that we, we want to be transparent, so we want to see the warts and all, because if you don't see that, you don't know how to address the root of the problem or even have a go at that. So we're thank thankful for the, the comments that you've made over the, uh, the past few years in particular. Uh, by yourself there, Chairman, uh, to, help, to help share that. But we'll take your comments on board. But thank you very much for your comments this morning. Thank you, and I think, like I say, hugely encouraging to hear about some of those facts and figures. And the 2% will live with me for some time. And I think that is a reassurance that people aren't just ticking off or they can look after themselves. And I think that, I, I, if you take nothing from this, uh, for me, that is... A, a, a big indication of just how well we've got this right. And I, uh, and I would say it was because the last time I was here, you asked about it, so I went away and checked. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I th like I say, that's why it's a, it is of a real benefit coming here. Um, and obviously, like I say, next time I will come and talk to you about um, adult MASH. So mm. hopefully, yeah. hopefully that will provide you with some assurances as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair, if it's okay with you, we'd, we'd perhaps like to stop for the, the last item, the right care, right person, yeah. if you don't mind, because we'd like to hear your report, and also perhaps we can add some bits into that that we've, we've now gleaned from some of the information that we've received as of late. Yeah. Uh, thank you, more than welcome. Um, moving on then to um, item seven, uh, which is right care, um, right place. Uh, we 
put this together, I'm, I'm sure members will be well aware, um, the issue raised some concerns. Uh, I think it was driven mainly by the police response nationally um, because of the pressure the police forces are under. Um, government were imposing requirements and performance indicators uh, and Councillor uh, Snape will remember this very well. Uh, when we had to uh, provide facts and figures around detection rates, around how we reduced crime, um, uh, and it formed uh, a big part of the early uh, 2000s. Uh, we then moved away from that. Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we moved away from that. I think, again, it, it created some perverse measurements, didn't it, Paul? As, you know, you, you did have to record how many miles you were driving and various other things. But um, the, nationally, then, the police moved away from that into a more woolly sort of uh, victim support type um, arrangements. Um, it looks like we're moving back towards some sort of performance. People want to know um, what the police are doing, what their results are, not only the police, but the broader community safety partnerships. Uh, to enable them to do that, they've had to look very carefully at all the other things that they do. Um, and there are some varying percentages around the amount of time and effort and money that uh, looking after vulnerable people uh, puts on uh, police forces nationally. Uh, some of them, 80% um, of the calls in a day are what they call safe and well checks. Uh, and the police, you could argue, some will argue quite rightly so, um, that's not necessarily the best use of warranted police officers. Uh, and actually with potentially increasing crime, uh, increasing levels and threats, uh, including terrorism, drugs, trafficking, and a whole host of other things, then people want their local police forces to have a, a clearer focus. And the police will say that this sort of safe and well check is better done by other people. Hence, right care, right, right person. Um, that clearly, though, raised some concerns, not least of all amongst members of this panel, but certainly much broader, um, about are they withdrawing completely? What does that look like? Um, what's going to happen when someone uh, is in need of help at 3 o'clock in the morning on the top of a block of flats or on a bridge or in something? Um, we then went through a process of inviting the commissioner here with uh, members of Staffordshire Police to get an understanding of what their plans are uh, we also then uh, went to the other main player, of course, which is mental health services here in Stafford, and we went to St George's Hospital. Um, both, I think we were pleasantly, uh, not surprised, but we received the right sort of response from both of the main players, uh, in as much as the police were very realistic about uh, what they expected to see in a reduction in work. And it was something like half of 7% or so. I, I can't remember all the figures now, but it was much lower than perhaps we'd feared and, and we worried. Uh, it comes along with uh, other additional support uh, with people who are mental health experts in uh, the control rooms in local police stations, who are on hand 24 hours a day to offer the best support and guidance around who is the best person, who's the right person, hence the title, uh, to be dealing with this. Uh, we also then had that complete assurance that no one is going to be left stranded on a, on a bridge somewhere or if they're in desperate need uh, as soon as uh, any sort of article to right to life uh, conditions e exist, then the police will uh, respond to that, quite, quite rightly so. Um, it comes in various phases. Uh, the first phase is underway. Uh, there are then subsequent phases, including uh, things like transporting people, which is yet another big burden on most police forces. Uh, when someone is arrested and uh, in need of a place of safety under the Mental Health Act, uh, the police then used to take them to police stations. That isn't, isn't done anymore. But it's not unusual for 
a police vehicle and at least two police officers to find themselves sitting in A&E for eight hours, handcuffed to someone, um, and that's not in anyone's best interest. So later phases are, will be an attempt to try to address that and make sure that that is done properly. Um, the feedback that we had from the hospital uh, was very positive. Uh, given the fact that there is far more thought and work going in early on when the f phone calls are first received with people in control rooms, um, something called the National Decision Making Model, uh, which is uh, a model that's been adopted by the police for many years, uh, uh, also now adopted by the health service and um, I, I'm hoping will be adopted by local councils. Uh, it sets out a very clear pathway of how these critical decisions are made and should be made and who should be making them and who should be dealing. Uh, and I think there's some peer-reviewed evidence to show that that is a really positive uh, way forward and, and, and it does work. And importantly, it is auditable uh, when inevitably some of these things uh, may, may go wrong. The final uh, part of that was to talk with people inside our own organization and not surprisingly they did echo some concern um, around the uh, potential increase for them you know I, we we don't have um, a 24 7 response uh, when someone uh, needs help at three o'clock in the morning there will be no one at the moment from uh, local authorities uh, uh, who who is there to, uh, to turn out. So it, it, it's not thought through completely yet, it's not perfect, but I think the overall picture that I was getting uh, was some concern locally uh, about the finer detail, uh, but some real reassurance from the other main partners about the mitigation that they plan to put in place and how that is likely, likely to work. Um, it's an unstoppable force, I'm afraid. Uh, all police forces will uh, go down uh, this route. Uh, they can provide some very clear evidence as to why they should be doing that. I think it's just incumbent on us, and hence why we started on this work and the report, uh, is to make sure that we are looking after those people properly and also making sure that our own organisation is able and capable to respond appropriately, you know, under the EHCR, that proportionate and necessary um, measurements that we, we have around that. So um, that really in a nutshell is what the report talks about. Um, that's where we are. It is ongoing uh, work uh, and it's ongoing from um, this committee. And I'd just be interested in any any comments? I think Councillor Snape, you were first. Thank you, Chair. 1829, when the Metropolitan Police was set up, there were four main points. The first one was protection of life and property. Then it went on to uh, pre prevention of crime, prosecution of offenders, etc. So really, if we go back to 1829, the protection of life and property, that has still got to take priority over what else the police force wants to do. Okay, yes, we do want them to uh, uh, detect crime, prosecute offenders, but really they're still out there to preserve life. And uh, so we must never go away from that. So whatever we do, we're a bit right person, whatever, we've still got to go back and look at that before we do anything else. And I think we've still got to work with the Chief Constable, the Police Commissioner, Social Service, whoever it is, and say, that's a priority. We want you to do that. We still want you to do these, but that must come first. We must never move away from that, even after uh, nearly 200 years. Uh, no, I think you, you, you're absolutely right. It would be a, a mistake to migrate away from that. But um, I don't know what other members felt, but when we spoke to the police commissioner, uh, I thought their expectations were very realistic. This, you know, it won't make a great deal of difference to our working day. Uh, however, that old sort of Pareto 80-20 rule you know, where 80% of the problems caused by 20% of the cause, uh, even dealing with, if you can find that 20% of people who are causing most of that and actually provide something around safeguarding for them, you can have 
a very significant reduction in uh, distress for those for individuals and also for work workload. And I, I was convinced that the police had that um, in mind. Councillor Ed Geller. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, all the explanation about this right, right uh, place, right person. I, I welcome the work that's going on uh, with this. I really feel that it's a, a vast move forward, actually. And speaking from life experiences, you know, I've been in the situation where I've had to dial 999, uh, having a violent son and being frightened for my own safety. The police arrived, three burly police officers, um, and I felt sorry for the police because, you know, they said this child's suffering from mental health problems. What? They didn't know what to do. They did not know where to go and what to do. So the work that's going on now, I really welcome it and moving forward that we can get some really good uh, feedback and that from it. So thank you. I think just on that point as well, I... Um, I, I, I was asked by the commissioner to sit on various panels around the use of force and stop and search powers and various other things. Uh, the use of force one is uh, that we assess seven to ten uh, body-worn video cameras of police officers when they're sent to deal with uh, violent people. Uh, there is a theme runs through it. A lot of those people aren't thinking straight, as you probably think. Um, they're very often controlled with force, uh, as, as you'd expect, uh, and, and also quite commonly now they have a hood put over their head to stop them spitting. Um, and when you think that can't be in anyone's best interest, so anything that we can do around right person, right care, to stop that from happening must be a positive step forward and be there. Uh, Councillor Pardashi. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to uh, work, work this out in my head. We've been told for a, a considerable time that um, the mental health support that a lot of people in need, they're on a waiting list, there's uh, a, consi a considerable strain on the, the system, and, and people are having to wait for an acceptable levels of time because of the uh, lack of support. And now the police, rightly or wrongly, are now withdrawing themselves, so to speak, in these situations. And we're told that the mental health support is being brought in. So how come it can be brought in now, but couldn't be brought in before to tackle the waiting list? I, I don't understand. So it seems like when we're put in that situation, we can come up with solutions. Otherwise, it, it's a sad case of people languishing on waiting lists uh, to access the support that they desperately need. So I don't understand how it can suddenly become available, Chair. No, I think you're right on that. I, I, a lot of these things happen because historically, certain organisations have taken over and taken control. Mm -hmm. Other agencies that might have thought it was their responsibility, and I have to be careful with my words here, but they sometimes take a step back because they're already busy, and mm -hmm. you know, the health, I'm not criticising the health service, but if you know that the police are safeguarding somebody overnight, sitting in a hospital with them, there's no urgency for you to go and do something. Mm -hmm. And I think we've slowly slipped into uh, that out of necessity, funding, availability, capability, and all those things. Mm -hmm. What was interesting, I think, and the point that you make, when we spoke to um, the nursing staff, they, when I say nursing staff, they were the chief nursing officers, I think, weren't they? And when we went to St. George's, their expectation is that if we get it right at the beginning, which is what part one of this policy is about, mm -hmm. then the number of people that are forcibly handcuffed and have a hood over their head should be significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. Their expectation is they won't be fighting fires all the time with people being dragged in. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it frees up that capability to deal with 
the waiting lists, deal with those people who are in some sort of uh, real crisis. So theoretically, it all looks right and proper and good. It's whether it works in practice, isn't it? And I think that that's the big uh, issue. And I think that's the one that we should concern ourselves with uh, as a committee and, and as a local authority is to make sure that we play an, impart, an important role in that uh, because the, the ambition is right, surely. Uh, all of our intentions uh, are right and the partners are. Uh, it should be a win-win if, it, if, uh, if it's done properly. Um, it should have been, I agree, should have been done years ago. But we are where we are. Um, Councillor Wilcox. Yeah, yes, thank you, Chair. I, th I think one of the tricks that were missed at the very early stage of the partnership being developed was the fact that all the organisations that spoke together, the people that weren't spoken to were local government and also the Department for Education. And I think those two key areas were missed off until the later stages of the actual partnership to come to coming together. And I, and I think you, I think rightly so, I think we have concerns. Um, and I think it, it's one of those whereby we'll have to see how it plays out. Certainly in the, through the Health and Wellbeing Board, we will want to make sure, and I know Paul will want to make sure, in relation to the safeguarding issues, that we really keep close to this and that people aren't slipping through the net. Because if anyone does slip through the net, we know where the blame will come and it won't, be, it won't necessarily be at the police's door. So I think from us, we need that assurance and reassurance from the police that the training is put in place to make sure that the people that make the decisions are doing it correctly and that people don't slip through and that there needs to be ongoing dialogue with ourselves local government in what we do as well as the department for, uh, for education as well to make sure they have a fully understanding of what's happening but you, you can be assured this committee can that paul who is obviously the lead on this will will stay very close to this and make sure that uh, anything that comes that isn't that isn't right will get flagged up at, at an early stage from ourselves I think, Chair, you hit the nail on the head about the custom and practice and how it's slipped into a, um, a position where it's been untenable for the police. And I think, if anything, it, it's refocused and had that refresh of conversations that the NHS, for example, have got obligations. They've, they've let the police sort of take over. It's been very convenient. And I think that we need to maintain that pressure that they need to come up with the goods. They need to, that, that handover period to to take off particularly vulnerable uh, mental health issued um, clients away from the police and, and, and let them continue to do their job rather than letting them, uh, as you say, you know, uh, be handcuffed for, for hours on end until they get some support. But I think critically, I think it's, it's having that effect to, to basically saying to the NHS, we need that, we need that support. And you're quite correct, Councillor Pardesi, you know, Where's that support been? It's always been there, but they've been reluctant to actually agree to doing that and putting that in place. We've seen evidence in the past of several attempts, sort of um, um, d offender teams that have been managed by community psychiatric nurses, for example, that have gone out there and, and, and screened out and worked with police in, actually in police custody suites. Um, but that refresh, I think, uh, from that conversation that this is all generated from the police, I think it's been helpful, but it's up to us really to maintain that pressure on, on those service providers that need to actually work with the police and work with us on that, as, as my colleague said, that the blame game starts, doesn't it, as soon as something goes amiss. Um, so it's important that we keep that pressure on the NHS to deliver where it's needed. I think you're absolutely right. No, I, I also think that a, a big element of this is it's a national thing, isn't it? This isn't something that Staffordshire is trying to deliver on its own. Um, Councillor Snow. Thank you, Chair. I think Councillor uh, Paul has put it in a nutshell, really. This is about protecting people on the streets 24-7. I don't think anyone's really going to jump queues. This is just helping people when they need help. Police officers are not retrained really in mental health issues. Yeah. They're trained in how to use force, unfortunately. Uh, and occasionally, people need uh, less force and more mental health assistance. And if it's going to get police officers working with the NHS, working with social services, and our uh, providers, as Paul has said, putting more into the system, it's got to help everybody in general. And over the course of years, it's going to bring that waiting list down because people are going to be dealt with a lot more resource who need it. 
uh, when you think how I've dealt with people in the past who have been shot because they were there causing problems. Uh, firearms, if they think it's a gun, it's, they, it's, they treat it as a gun. Uh, and I remember a couple I went to where people were shot, uh, who perhaps in hindsight didn't need shooting, but they put themselves in such a way, uh, firearms, that they're there to protect the public, firearms officers, uh, and a, a person was shot. So we're hoping that all this working together will stop all that happening. The public will be a, a better safety. There'll be less complaints afterwards uh, because hindsight is 100% vision. Uh, police officers are making decisions on very little evidence what they've got to do. So uh, it'll help everybody. That's the way I see it. And I well, hope to God it does. Thank you for that, Councillor Ed Geller. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, just to say, actually, listening to uh, <coughs> Neil Carr yesterday, uh, talking about the new crisis centre at St George's, which will be, I can't wait for that to open, to be honest with you. So we're hoping, and especially the fact it's going to take children, and it should be open in October. That's what we were told yesterday. So quite excited about that, that we will be able to move forward helping people, and especially with the children. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Walmer. Thank you. Um, I just want to run a scenario past you. I think we've, we're talking about the organisations predominantly about the processes that they need to change. If, if you take this scenario, so you, you are someone who's in uh, distress or a family member is seeing that one of their family members is in distress, the, the go-to is probably to ring the police. Uh, and, and Anna's just explained that sort of situation. Um, now, in, in, in many situations, there's a threat to life, so the police under this process will attend. Right, there's no problem with that. But there are many situations that are probably borderline or just kind of south of the risk to life. Um, and in this, in this first phase, the police will not attend. Right, that's, is that, that's correct. So the, qu the question is, th those people who have been calling the police, and, and normally it's probably uh, the, the same cohort of individuals who might be doing this, they're, they're going to ring the police, but then there's going to be no response, potentially. Um, I is there anything that's being put in place by mental health services to be able to work with those people who are under that threat to life threshold so that those people feel like they're supported? Because if not, the criticism will be you're pulling yet another service away from residents who, who, who really need it. And, and I think the police, unfortunately, whilst I think this is the right approach, will be will be heavily criticised for pulling out of that space, even though we know that the mental health services should probably be filling that gap. I just wonder what, you, what your thoughts are. Thank you. Councillor Northam. Yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, Councillor. I think that, that we need to get established that quality of information at the first point of contact. That leads everything, really, because the, the more that we know about that person, the more that we can signpost to particular services. If that person is known to the service, if they're not known to the service, for example, um, where they've posed uh, behaviour traits before that have been very similar, similar threats, similar actions. So that quality, that first contact is important. Mm -hmm. So the informant needs to give that information as much as they can to allow others to process it to the right persons. Because that's where the, the, the people slip through the net in terms of a right response by the proportion of the police. Because if it is, for example, they've got a weapon or it's a threat to their own life, then the police are the only people that actually can have the hands on, other than common law, where the public can actually take that into their own hands. And, and there's a whole risk of ramifications once that's been taken on board, uh, obviously threat to personal life, etc. So that, that, f that first information for the police to be able to act appropriately, I think is vitally important. And I think we, we, we need to shape mm -hmm. services into pushing and, and at least inquiring for that information rather than just accepting the person's first report on that. They need to, to push them to say, what exactly do you know? What are you seeing? What are you observing? What's your feeling? Is anybody else involved? And do you know that person? We need to be asking that questions and, and just ask teasing a little bit more of mm -hmm. the quality information so we can appropriate, appropriate response very quickly. Uh, thank you for that. I, I also assume that if, if there is no article two threat to life, then we'd move back to the report that we were discussing previously, which is early intervention with um, 
with people. Um, I also think from my experience previously, uh, and I know it's a, a little old now, uh, but certainly when I uh, w was in the police and dealing with some of these issues, um, adult safeguarding wasn't part of the MASH in any local authority. It's been part of a Staffordshire MASH for many years, hasn't it? You know, so, uh, And I think that's a massive step forward when we talk about how, who should be acting and doing the right sort of things. If you have a process that's already uh, pulling all of those other partners together, I think we're, we're streets ahead. I, I don't know whether other councils have moved to that yet, but, but I think you know, we should recognise that Staffordshire has done that for many, many years. Um, Councillor Pardeshi. Thank you, Chair. Just two very quick points. I like to think as well that maybe um, this uh, uh, adjustment in this process is always uh, also going to have a knock-on effect on the prevention of criminalising um, mental uh, health as well. There are too many people in our prisons with mental health issues who shouldn't be there. Uh, and secondly, Chair, um, sadly our body cam um, uh, setup isn't always what it's cracked up to be. I'm sure you're aware there are too many examples of when the cameras should be on and for whatever reason, they're not. Thank you, Chair. Data is going to play such an important part in this. I mean, you've dealt with uh, mental health service and you've dealt with the police as well. Do you know if the police service, like who will take the initial calls, uh, force control or whatever it's called these days, uh, for Staffordshire will have access to all this information because if they phone up and say Mr Smith is doing X, Y and Z and they already know that he's got mental health issues, maybe he's, he's on record, it may be a different response to uh, Joe Soap who they know nothing about. That's, that's all. Do we know if they're going to have access to those sort of records? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure what uh, a modern police control room has access to. I think we were reassured that that they do have that, but importantly, the additional staff, I think their health service staff, that will be in control rooms, bring with them that other vital piece of information to check health records. So uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the plan is that as soon as that call comes in, there will be a combined health and police, at least intelligence picture, that suggests perhaps the best way, the best way forward. Um, at that, before I'm completely blinded. Um, I'm just trying to sort of sit. No, it's okay. Um, thank you for um, bringing that. I'm saying thank you. It's my report. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank myself um, for the quality of this report. No, uh, El, El, that, that, thank you. I think it is important, though, that um, we are ahead of the game. It's something that we is at the forefront of our mind, looking at asking all of these uh, challenging, difficult questions, holding some of these partners to account. Uh, I was really encouraged to hear the Health and Wellbeing uh, Committee is taking that forward. And I think it's important that maybe we offer ourselves as that scrutiny panel should uh, there be a need for us to escalate any of these um, issues. It, it, it is going to happen. It's about how well we protect our own organisation and more importantly the people out there that need some of these uh, services. Uh, and I have to say it's not perfect but I, I get the impression that we're moving in the right direction and all, all partners are pulling um, in the right direction. So thank you. You have to tell me what it says. I can't remember. Yeah. Okay so the, so uh, the recommendations from the report, the first one I think we've accepted that, that everybody's comfortable with it, it in principle. The second one is because clearly we've tried to, as far as we can to avoid duplication um, and because the, the Health and Wellbeing Board in its membership already has round the table health colleagues and police representatives as well as, as um, well Mr Wilcox you'll be on there as the Vice Chair won't you? Mr. Sutton is currently chairing it, so uh, that it seems eminently sensible that they are monitoring the ongoing implementation of this. Clearly, if there's anything specific that 
members in here are concerned about or if the Health and Wellbeing Board has anything specific they want to refer to us, then that's a further piece of work for this committee. But otherwise, the monitoring of, of how that works going forward will be with the Health and Wellbeing Board if members are happy with that. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much and thanks for coming and presenting. Um, I think there are... The last item is the uh, work program. Has anyone had a chance to look through it and see it? Everyone happy with where it is and uh, what we're doing? Helen, if you could just run us through. Okay, very, very quickly, obviously we're coming to the end of this municipal year. Um, as was mentioned earlier, members had been, we, we discussed at pre-preview really, and again today, the idea of a visit to the MASH. So I've put some initial dates out to everybody and the one that's looking most likely is the 28th, which is why Clive referred to it, because I've asked him to pencil that in. But um, there's a couple of things I need to check, and I will send an electronic invitation out to everybody as soon as those have been firmed up. But that's looking currently to be the most likely date. Just going back on um, previous um, meetings, we'd uh, members had asked that a letter go to the planning chairs for all the districts and boroughs about vaping that has been sent out and I'll email a copy of that letter to you so you've got that for reference. There is a triangulation meeting between the chair and uh, vice chairs and cabinet members next week which will look at um, issues for the new municipal year really for the work programme to see what we might be including on that and then next meeting um, isn't at, uh, it, so the next meeting you've got you've got um, got the two items that Ruth referred to, but you've also got the um, outcome of the Ofsted inspection. And the reason we left it until that date was because they're coming with an action plan as well. So you're not just getting the results, which you will have seen anyway, because that was circulated, but they're also coming with the action plan to explain what they're doing to address some of the concerns that were raised. Anything else? Go on. The triangulation meeting. The triangulation meeting. I've got, actually, I was going to ask that question. I've got it in my diary, diary for the 22nd and the 23rd. I don't know if it's been moved. It's Thursday off the top of my head. I'll just find. 22nd. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so that's just chair and vice chairs of this committee, so that's Mr. State, Mrs. Burnett and Mr. Spencer, meeting with the cabinet members and with key officers to look at items for uh, consideration to be included on the work programme moving forward. Uh, sorry, Queen's on. Yeah. 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 Questions on a postcard, if you, um, if you want. A uh, couple. Um, serious case reviews. I don't think we've had any here at this committee, have we, uh, to discuss. I, I have on the grapevine hearing that there is some, maybe a couple, going on. I just wonder whether we could just find out and make sure that we do actually get to hear about those and see what the learning is from them. That's, yeah, num that's number one. Number two is around the independent report. Um, from the children's board have we had any thoughts about how we might want to scrutinize that any further Bob or, or is there a, is there a plan the, um, with uh, Clive um, about uh, that he he did say uh, to me that he didn't recognize that report uh, uh, or the bits and pieces that, that were in it and that's where the invitation came then for us to all go and visit the, the MASH. Um, so we drew a halt to where we were pushing with that because the ultimate was we were going to invite all the great and the good from the police, our own and, and various other people here. And rather than have that fall flat on its face if this report is, um, is wrong, then I thought we would... Let's see if we can reassure ourselves first at this visit to the MASH and then take it from there whether 
we want to call people in to, uh, to take it any further. Because I, I, when I, I, I have to, I might be still, still published on. Um, I think that's be, be, that's probably the best way forward, unless you disagree. No, that's if you're if you're happy with that, then I'm then I'm happy. But um, I do think we should just keep it on our radar Absolutely. after the mash visit, just to reassure ourselves that we haven't got any gaps that we need to explore further. Yeah. I think I, we, I, as we, we've heard through uh, throughout this morning, um, we are faced with other reports that say everything's not hunky dory, but it looks right, and we've got this anomaly of this report that was done, and that is always somewhere in the background. Uh, Clive then uh, said that he didn't recognise that or the criticisms in it, and and hence I thought, well, let's pursue that first rather than go leaping in and. Because if we have the chief constable here and the uh, chief exec, and actually they bring the data to show everything is right and proper, then that to a degree we're sitting with egg on our face, aren't we? You know, so I think let's go and in a relaxed environment, asking some challenging questions uh, about the mash, about how it's working, and how um, convinced he is that vulnerable people are safe. And then we'll have another meeting to decide whether we want to take it any further. And on that note, thank you very much indeed for coming. And I'll uh, see you soon. So the... Um